All right. As chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, and in, in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a committee meeting for the purpose of receiving agency revenue presentations. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during the meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House Rules RSA 91-A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access this meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that that are on the meeting assisting us, which is Christopher Shea from the LBA and Brad Greenland. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call. Let's start the meeting by taking the roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting which is required under the right to know law. And there's one more thing I would like to ask that you state that Thursday we'll be holding a public hearing for seven bills at the LOB. And it's, we want to know whether you're going to be attending virtually or personally. So when you do answer the role, if you would indicate that so Representative Bromney can make a note of this, because there's not room for everybody to attend personally. So um, if you can attend virtually, that's fine. So Representative Bernstein, would you take the role? You got to unmute, uh, Alan. You got to unmute. Thank you. Apologies, Representative Abrami. Yes, I'm here in Stratum uh, alone, and I will be attending Thursday in person. Representative Griffin. Uh, you have to unmute, Mary. Well, Mary's figuring that out. Let's move on to Representative Olery. Present uh, in my office alone. My wife's in the house. And uh, I'll virtual on Thursday. Say virtual? Virtual. Okay, thank you. And, and Representative Olery, can you turn up your, vo your speaker volume? That would help. So go ahead, Representative. Uh, Representative Ober. I'll be virtual on Thursday. Representative Doucette. Good morning, uh, alone in my home office in Salem, and I look forward to seeing you in person on Thursday. Excellent. Your clerk is Representative Burstein, and I'm in my home office in Nottingham. There might be a dog or two in the room, and I plan on attending in person on Thursday. Representative Elliott. Representative Elliott, you have to unmute yourself. Representative Elliott, unmute yourself and tell us you're here. Okay. 
You're still muted, Representative Elliott. Brad, can you help him out? A moment. Brad, could you help yep. Representative Elliott unmute I, 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 himself? Ask him to unmute. Uh, Representative Elliott, can, 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 can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm unmuted. Are you, are you, on Thursday, will you be there in person or virtually? Virtual. Representative Janigian. Well said. I'm uh, in my home in Salem, New Hampshire. My wife and daughter are somewhere in the house. I will attend virtually on Thursday. Representative Nunez. Representative Nunez. Representative Baxter. Thank you, Representative. Um, I'm here alone and I'm going to attend virtually on Thursday. Representative Stillsbury. I'm here at my home alone in Charlestown, New Hampshire, and plan to attend in person Thursday. Representative Tudor. I'm here alone in my cellar. Wife and grandkids are upstairs, and I'll be attending virtually on Thursday. Representative Almi. I'm home alone in Lebanon, and I will be virtual. Representative Ames. Yeah, hi, I'm here in Jaffray alone in my office and I will attend virtually on Thursday. Thank you. Representative Southworth. Hi, Representative Southworth. I'm home alone in Dover and I will be attending virtually. Representative Malloy. I'm home alone in Greenland and I will be attending virtually. Representative Schamberg. Uh, I'm in my truck in Wilmot and I will be attending the meeting personally. Representative Tucker. Yes, I'm alone in Randolph and I plan to be virtually present on Thursday, slightly late. I'm uh, testifying before Public Works at 930. Representative Gomarlo. I am here in Swansea alone and I'll attend virtually on Thursday. Representative Lofman. Representative Lofman. Representative Gorg. Good morning. I am in my home in Lee by myself and I will be virtual on Thursday. Thank you. Representative Haken, Haken Phillips. Good morning. I'm present in my Concord office alone. Uh, I'm planning to attend virtually on Thursday as well. Representative Murphy. Good morning. I am present here in Hanover in my house. My wife and daughter are elsewhere in the home and I will be attending virtually on Thursday. Representative Major. I'm here in my house. My uh, wife is in the other room and I will be present. Okay. And let's go back to Representative Griffin. Um, Brad, can you remind Mary how to unmute herself on the phone? Is it yes, star? I believe it's star six to unmute. Star six to unmute. Good morning, Mary. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. On Thursday, do you plan on uh, attending virtually or in person? Uh, in person, I believe. Excellent. Okay, that completes the roll call. There are 22 of us here, two are absent. Thank you. Okay, we have a very busy day today. We have eight presentations from the various agencies. Um, starting with the Legislative Budget System Office, then followed by the Department of Revenue, Lottery Commission, Liquor Commission this morning, and this afternoon, the Judicial Branch, Department of Health and Human Services, Security Bureau, and the Department of Justice. And, and tomorrow, we'll be hearing from the Insurance Department, Department of Safety, Department of Transportation, Fish and Game Commission, Department of Administrative Services, 
and the Treasury Department. Each one of these presenters will be presenting virtually and we'll start off with the Office of Legislative Budget Assistant and Chris Shea. Good morning, uh, Chairman, Major and Committee. Um, my purpose today to speak with you is to be very brief because we've got DRA coming on and they have a lot of information they wanna share with you. Um, but it's just to discuss my role with the committee so that you kind of understand the purpose of what I'm here to do and what to help get you through. Um, your charge is to come up with some estimates on revenues, specifically unrestricted revenues of the general fund, fishing game fund and highway fund. Along with the general fund, you will address education trust funds. And I will help coordinate and put together the materials that you need as you go forward with this process. So your next two days, you have um, agencies scheduled to talk with you. Um, that was at the direction of Representative Major and I contacted the agencies and, and let them know what um, they should be presenting today um, to get you started. I just wanted to kind of walk you through the process as well. Um, so you're going to get lots of information thrown at you. You're going to hear about a variety of different revenue sources and how the um, agencies um, are involved in collecting that and, and remitting that back to the state. Um, one thing that I did do is put together kind of a handbook or a document, and I'm just going to share my screen. I'm not going to go through the whole document, but there are some pieces of it I wanted to share with you. So let me see. Oh. Brad, could you turn on the screen share? It says it's disabled right now. So I'll just keep talking as, as I wait for that. So you, as you go through your estimates, you're gonna be revisiting fiscal year 21, figuring out um, where you are in terms of the year and where you might end. And then you're going to address 22 and 23. At the end of that process, this committee will put together a house resolution of what your estimates are. Okay. And that will go before um, the full body of the house and you will discuss it. And typically in the past that, that document has been tabled. So let me just stop there for a minute. So you should always just see a document with uh, LBA across the top, the uh, New Hampshire quarter. That's we, we see it. Okay. So the, right after that is a contact page for our office because we're working remotely. The best way to contact me is through email. Um, but here are the various people in our office. Mike Kane spoke with this committee last week. Um, Mike Hoffman, Mickey Landrigan, Nancy Levinas, and Kevin Ripple are all our budget analysts who are um, working currently with house finance and putting together information as it relates to the operating budget. My other charge is not only house and ways and means, but I also work with the capital budget. So I'll be working with public works to put that together as well. But again, that's just our, our information. If you come into Call our office, you will typically um, see Pam Ellis, who's our administrative assistant. She's kind of the point person for us. She's the knower of all information. So the way this document structured is that um, there's some information on different acronyms or terms you may hear throughout the process, followed by um, just a quick summary of the various tax rates for the general and education trust, trust fund revenues that are collected. After that is the resolution that was done for fiscal year 2019 for your 21, uh, excuse me, 2021 um, operating budget. And then I'll show you um, House Bill 1, or in this case, it was House Bill 3, the operating budget, and where your estimates end up in there. Understand that when you're doing your estimates, they will be done on current law. So you, at the Committee of the Ways and Means, you will see bills coming in that suggest or would want to make changes to some of the revenue streams that you're collecting. Um, you wouldn't consider that in your estimates. That would be something that would be addressed um, after. And when I say after, that would be incorporated into a surplus statement that's prepared by our office at the direction of um, legislative leadership. Um, House Finance and, and the Ways and Means Chair um, would direct our office to put together that surplus statement and include certain information. So, again, I just, I just mentioned here's some of the terms that you may see. Uh, one thing that people sometimes hear and confuse is you'll hear the term road toll. That is not the, the tolls that you see on the turnpike system. 
It is actually your gas tax that you, you'll hear about for your highway fund for unrestricted revenues. Um, but it's easy to get that, that mixed up. Um, as I said, there's a page that just kind of shows you the, the rates. So across the top here, you'll see the business profits tax. It's located in RSA 77A. The rates are contained in colon two. The total rate for your business profit tax right now is 7.7%. Of that 1.5% goes to the education trust fund and 6.2% goes to your general fund. That's directed by the statutes. At the end of this document, are the, the statutes are listed along with some historical information. This next document or piece of document that I'm showing you starting on page four is the house resolution in 2019 for the operating budget. So once your committee was done, we put together this resolution that shows you the education trust fund and general fund um, revenue totals. So you had your official estimate for fiscal year 19, and then what the committee believed was going to happen with revenues to the rest of 19. So that you can see the numbers are slightly different than what had been projected before. And then from there, you built your estimates for 20 and 21. And you did the same thing for the highway fund and the fishing game fund. So you're gonna be seeing um, information, historical information coming to you from the agencies today. They're gonna to talk about the last five years of their revenue collections. Um, you'll be able to see some trends with that. There's information in this document as well that you can look at. Um, I reference other documents within this to direct you to as well. So once all your estimates are done, the resolutions passed and you, your numbers are then included into the house version of the operating budget typically that's House Bill 1. In this case, it ended up being House Bill 3. Um, can I you'll, pull you back? I'm right in the middle of this. And you'll find um, in the budget, you'll find your operating budget, your unrestricted revenues in what they call the back of the, of the budget. So as you can see here, this is page 709 of the operating budget. All the information before that is the, the numbers, you know, the dollars that have been appropriated to the agencies. Everything after that are what we refer to as the back of the budget or sections in the back of the budget. And it has things like here, this is positions that have been abolished from the budget because um, these are included in the operating budget, these position numbers, if they, an agency no longer needs them or the legislature has decided that they need to reduce some positions, they actually have to abolish the positions. But then you will see Here's your unrestricted revenues. These again are just the estimates that you've made based on current law. These will be adjusted through each phase of the budget process. So the House will have its version, the Senate would have its version, and then at committee of conference, after um, whatever agreements are made, there would be a committee of conference um, past version of the, of the um, revenues. And as I stated, there may be some that get passed by the House. There may be bills that are passed by the Senate and House and, and, and look like they're going to go into current law. As each phase goes, we will incorporate those into the surplus statement. And this document you see on your screen now is, is a um, surplus statement for the current biennium we're in. And again, it, it, you address the year that you're building the budget in. So in this case, you're dealing with fiscal year 2019, and then you have your fiscal 20 and 21 after that. On row four are your estimated revenues. So these are your, truly the numbers from House Bill 1 totaled up. This is education trust fund and general fund together. And then row five would be any revenue adjustments. And those revenue adjustments would be, again, any bills that would make changes to the um, revenues going forward that have been passed or you believe will be passed or any language that's contained in House Bill 2 or the trailer bill. The trailer bill typically accompanies the operating budget. And if I take you to, so this, this page here, page 15, um, it shows you schedule one, which again is all the, the, this is just the general funds. We break it up by general and education trust funds. So these are the revenues that were contained in um, House Bill 1 or the operating budget. And then there's a page starts called schedule two and you'll see there's a whole bunch of activity on there. And the first top of that are revenue adjustments, 
and why there's an adjustment being made. So line four, for instance, in the operating budget, they added um, some DRA auditor positions and had some uh, revenue estimates associated with adding those positions of $200,000 in fiscal year 20 and then 2 million um, in 2021. There was language that um, dealt with business tax conformity. There was language related to the tobacco tax and um, applying the tax to e-cigarettes. And there's different assumptions made on what revenue would be collected. So that's where that gets taken care of. We, again, we do the same thing for the highway fund. I'm scrolling slowly so I don't get anybody too sick with the motion. So we do the same thing with the highway fund as well as the fish and game fund. So there's a surplus statement that's issued by our office to give you a sense of what's occurring. Um, typically, we have the four columns, uh, governor, house, senate, and committee of conference. On the earlier for the general fund education trust fund, because the budget was vetoed and there was a um, negotiation that occurred to um, get by that veto and pass a budget, there was some changes that did occur in, in um, House Bill 3. So once the budget's passed, the Department of Administrative Services takes the revenue information and builds um, a revenue, a monthly revenue plan. They do that with advice and, and discussions with the agencies that collect the revenues. And it's just to get a sense of when you're going to see revenues come into the state um, on a cash basis. And you, you'll, you'll hear as you go through this process, you know, there, there's five months that are typically your larger months for revenue collection, September, December, which have already occurred, and then March, April, and June. And you've, you will often hear that the house is at a disadvantage with the revenue projections because you haven't seen March and April's revenues. Um, the past few biennium, the House Ways and Means Committee has met in April, May, and sometimes beginning of June as you're going through this process to revisit your revenues. And you may even do an amendment to the resolution that you had tabled earlier. Um, part of that is just to make sure that you have some um, up-to-date information on what's going on with the revenues. So when you go to committee of conference, you can have that discussion with the Senate. The revenue plan is put together for the general fund, the education trust fund, um, fishing game and highway funds. And again, it's just a plan, it's an estimate. You will sometimes see from one month to the next that maybe a revenue stream was below plan, but it comes in the following month. Um, so sometimes there's a timing issue of, of when things are collected. So you, you'll hear that discussed. And then what the department does after that is at the end of each month, they put together the monthly revenue focus. And you should start to receive that. Um, this is a good document to tell you or get, provide you some insight as to what's occurring um, with the collection of your revenues. This current month is will show you um, the collection for the month of this is December. So in December, your actuals compared to plan and if you are below or above that. This analysis is just a brief um, commentary from the agencies on what's happening with some of the major taxes that are being collected. Um, sometimes it helps explain why a number is up or down in a particular month and what to expect maybe in the upcoming month. There's other information contained in this document that relates to real estate um, transfer tax, meals and rooms, um, cigarette, uh, tobacco tax stamps. Um, there's also fishing game and highway fund at the uh, end of this. This table here would show you just a comparison of uh, fiscal 21 to fiscal 20. And then again, I think what is probably more useful in this document is this year to date comparison. So this provides you how much revenue have you collected through December. And if you go down to the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that you're 54 $0.3 million ahead of plan after you've accounted for the $30 million of um, that you've heard mentioned of the anomalous right. revenue that came in 21 that should have been credited to 20 and has been done um, in the CAFR, but because this is on a cash basis, it still shows up in the numbers. And so they just do a, a correction on this table. And at the end of the year, they'll reverse that out. They be in the Department of Administrative Services. And then this table 
here just shows you where the um, revenue is attributable to that they're the $30.8 million. And as I said, you got the highway and the fishing game fund also on here. So it's a, it's a nice document to look at. You typically will see that um, three to five business days after the close of the month. Um, the department usually will email that, but it will, it's also available on their website and there's links on our website to that. This page here just gives you a sense of, for some of the revenue that's collected, and we'll use meals and rooms as an example. So in December, when you see the meals and rooms revenue, that is for the activity that occurred in November. So just to kind of keep that in mind when you're looking at some of these, that it's for the prior month's activity that you're giving, you're um, seeing when you look at the current month. And then this is a document that our office puts together. Um, at the end of each month, we will put all the data into the spreadsheet. And what it provides you is over seven years, um, kind of, how much was collected in dollars on a cash basis, but then what percentage of the year of collection that was. So for instance, if you look at the business profits tax, you'll see that, you know, in 21, you collected $26 million, but typically you're somewhere between not, not 10 million and 17 million. So you're up in, in 21. So that may be something that you consider as you think about your estimating. This is a 15 page document, so I'll just scroll through real quick. The CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, which has now been released. It was released just prior to December 31st. Um, there's just a couple of pages I wanted to point out in there. Page eight is a surplus statement. So that would be the information that um, has been audited. So those are the real numbers. Those are the of, of what occurred in terms of revenues and any um, appropriations that were, were expended. And then also in that same report on page 146, you have a historical, they could provide a 10 year um, recap of the, of the revenues that have been collected. There's other information, but I just point out the revenues. So in this case, it's the general funds and you can see the beer taxes from 2011 has been ranging from $12.9 million to a low of 12.6 in 2017 to 13.1 in 2020. So it just gives you a sense of um, how the flow of the, the revenue is occurring. I also show that for the education trust fund, fishing game fund and the highway fund. So they're also in there. And I'm speeding up a little bit because I, I'm gonna need to stop because I wanna let DRA get started. Um, I also took a snippet from the um, offering statement from treasury for the bonds. And the reason that I included this is there's some good information as it relates to the revenue stabilization reserve account, as well as the various revenues that you're collecting. So starting on page, there's an it's called information uh, statement within the document on page 13 of that is the revenue stabilization reserve account. And following that are state revenues. And it just gives you a little bit of history on each of those, just a narrative um, to read about if you're trying to get a sense of what's going on with a particular tax. And then as I stated, the last part of this document contains the RSAs as it relates to the various revenue sources that you're looking at. So here's the education trust fund. This RSA tells you the various components that are um, deposited into that. Here's the business tax, uh, business profits tax. So again, RSA 77A2 tells you what the tax rate is. And then in this case, where the funds are going is 77A20, colon 20. So that's what I provide you in terms of the RSAs in this document. And then I follow that with these blue and gray um, charts. These are actually charts that come out of the DRA's um, 2020 annual report. And that provides you a history of the inception of the tax all the way through uh, the most recent um, completed year, which is 2020. So you can read all the changes that have occurred and find a historical context for that if you, if you choose to do, do so. So again, there's a lot of information there. You're gonna hear from the agencies, you're gonna get a lot more information. Um, I just want you to know my role is to assist you with any questions you might have. So as you look at things and you're wondering, um, 
well, I don't understand where this tax you know, came from or who's paying for that. And you can reach out to me. If I can answer the question, I will. If I can't, I'll reach out to those um, individuals that could provide that answer or connect you with those individuals. But I am here as a resource to you um, and, and hope to be used in that fashion. So th that's all I have now. Um, again, I think we want to get DRA started because they do have a lot of information for you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. But if not, well, well, thank you, Chris. It was a great high-level um, review of, of what the LBA does to assist us in doing our work in generating revenues. So next, we want to go to the Department of Revenue Administration, and yep. we'll have on Commissioner Lindy, Lindsay Stepp, Assistant Commissioner Carolyn Lear, Senior Financial Analyst Melissa Rollins, and Financial Analyst Devin uh, Rodkew. So, uh, Commissioner, you're on. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thanks for having us today. As a reminder, for the record, Lindsay Stepp, Commissioner at the New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration. I'm going to take just a second to share my screen and pull up our presentation. Can everyone see our presentation? Head nod, perfect, thank you. Okay, so good morning again. As Mr. Chair mentioned, we have uh, the full DRA Dream Team here today. I spoke to all of you for quite a while last week, so um, I decided to break things up today. You'll get to hear from all of us. Um, as we move through the presentation, we're going to go through each of the major taxes that the DRA collects, give you the background on them. We will then, um, at the end, give some initial revenue estimates for fiscal year 21 and some ranges for 22 and 23. And last but not least, I'm gonna give everyone an update on our new revenue information management system. Lindsay, do you want to go through the presentation first and then questions? Um, I think, you know, it worked really well last week where we stopped at the end of each tax and addressed any questions um, relevant to that tax type then. So I think we'll probably follow that same um, process if that works for you, Mr. Chair. That works. Okay, thank you. Okay, so first, just the mission of the Department of Revenue. Um, our mission is to fairly and efficiently administer the tax laws of the state of New Hampshire, collecting the proper amount of taxes due, incurring the least cost to the taxpayers in a man manner that merits the highest degree of public confidence in our integrity. Further, we provide prompt and constructive assistance to the municipal units of government in matters of budget, finance, and the appraisal of real estate. In terms of taxpayer interaction, it is the policy of the Department of Revenue to administer the tax laws of the state of New Hampshire in a manner um, that demonstrates efficiency, fairness, and courtesy to every taxpayer. And we do take that our taxpayer interaction um, very seriously. Just to give you an overview of the Department of Revenue, this is a copy of our organization chart. You'll see all the way on the left, the administration unit that is led by Carolyn Lear, assistant commissioner. And that's all of your back office functions, our business office, project management, tax policy and legislative analysis group who will be presenting today, legal, internal audit, HR, et cetera. We then have our audit division, which does exactly that. They audit the taxpayers in the state of New Hampshire. They're broken out into different groups depending on the type of businesses. So we have the in-state bureau, which um, audits businesses that are solely contained in New Hampshire. We have the multi-state um, group, which would uh, audit your very large multinational corporations. And then we have the multi-entity group, which audits more of your regional businesses. So like a regional New England business or something like that. Also with our multi-entity group, we have our tobacco group and that um, audits the tobacco tax uh, to uh, ensure our compliance with um, the tobacco tax settlement agreement. We also have a discovery, discovery bureau within the audit division, which um, seeks to find um, new or non-compliant taxpayers. So taxpayers that may not be aware of their obligation here in New Hampshire. And then lastly, our hearings management um, who handle the appeals that come through the department. 
we have our collections division, which does our collections for us. So when all appeal rights have been exhausted and um, someone still owes money to the department and to the state, they will be contacted by our collections division. We have our municipal and property division. And those are the folks um, that handle the overseeing the appraisal of real estate in the state of New Hampshire. They also in our municipal unit set all of the tax rates um, in the state, as well as oversee and provide guidance um, for finance related questions from the municipalities. We have our utility property group who assess utility property in the state and then timber and gravel or sticks and stones. They help the municipalities administer the timber tax and the gravel tax. Lastly, all the way on the right on our org chart is taxpayer services. So this is the division within the department um, that processes our mail, processes all of our revenue. Um, they perform account maintenance. They man our call center. So if you call into the DRA, you will talk to someone in taxpayer services. This is kind of a one-stop shop for any questions that don't have to deal with an audit or collections issue. Um, you'll be sent to the taxpayer services division. I am going to potentially turn it over to Assistant Commissioner Carolyn Lear to talk through the next few slides. Although um, I might ask, could Carolyn Lear, Melissa Rollins, and Devin Roderick all have the ability um, to speak? Brad, I'm not sure that they do at the moment. Brad? Uh, yes, they should all have the ability to speak. Right okay. Now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Carolyn Lear, Assistant Commissioner at the Department of Revenue. Um, good to all be with you today. Um, I'm gonna talk about specifically the tax policy and legislative analysis group, which will be your primary contact throughout the legislative session. Um, that's going to be me, uh, Melissa Rollins, who is a senior financial analyst with the department and Devin Roderick, who is a financial analyst with the department. Um, last session, you may have been familiar with interacting with Sean Thomas. He has um, left state service for another opportunity. So we will be the three that you'll be communicating with primarily along with Commissioner Stepp. And what we do throughout the legislative session is we prepare fiscal note worksheets and quick guides um, for legislation that comes before your committee. If you haven't seen them yet, a quick guide is a document that we're going to be preparing for you um, for any legislation where we completed a fiscal note. It's our attempt to give you a uh, easily digestible um, understanding of the bill and how we came up with our um, fiscal impact analysis. And we certainly hope you find those helpful. Um, we'll work with you in analyzing tax policy and fiscal impact one of us or more of us will attend um, most, if not all of your hearings and be available during work sessions um, and executive sessions to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we'll occasionally testify uh, before you regarding tax policy and fiscal impact. We'll track legislation. And then at the end of the session, um, we'll set forth with the task of implementing all of the tax law changes that you might passed during the legislative session. You can go ahead, Lindsay. Um, this slide is just a quick tool um, to let you know all of the taxes that the department administers. Um, it lists the tax, the current rate, as well as the statute that implements the tax. And then below, you'll know there's a short list of the taxes we don't administer, um, but often you get inquiries about the insurance premium tax, which is administered by the Department of Insurance, although we do get data about the IPT um, because it does um, act as a credit against business taxes, um, the beer tax, and then the road toll, which Chris talked about, um, is the gas tax. And then here is all of the taxes that we administer with the fiscal year 2020 audited revenue um, totaling $2.3 billion. <clears throat> and 
the NFQA met and railroad tax are unaudited cash, um, just to note there. But moving on to the next slide, I think this is particularly an interesting visual to help you visualize um, the proportion of revenue that each tax makes up. So if you take a look at, for example, the business profits tax, which is in sort of a dark blue, and then the biz business enterprise tax in purple, you can see that business taxes are greater than a quarter of all taxes that the department administers, um, followed up by the property tax and the meals and rentals tax, um, all above 10% of total revenue, and then some of the smaller taxes, um, less than 10%. So in this presentation and in a lot of our presentations before you, um, we'll spend a lot of time talking about business taxes and rightly so because it makes up um, a good proportion of the total taxes that we collect. And now I think we're gonna hand it over to Melissa Rollins and Devin Roderick, our financial analysts. Good morning. So we're going to start with business profits tax. This tax is under RSA 77A. It's 7.7% of taxable business. Can you talk louder? The tax is 7.7% of taxable business profits for period ending December 31st. Hey Brad, can you turn up that volume? I'm not able to, uh, if they're on their computer, you have to go into their settings and turn up their volume. Yeah. Melissa would help if uh, you could turn up your volume. How about now, can you hear me now? Better, it could be better. Okay, let me start over. For business profits tax, it's under RSA 77A. It's 7.7% of taxable business profits for tax period ending on or after 12-31-2019. So our current rate is the 7.7%. Who's taxable? Every enterprise organization for gain or profit turning on any business activity within the state. The threshold for the business profits tax is gross business income in excess of 50,000 from all activities. And then on the right, where when to file, this is for calendar year filers. Chris chatted about this earlier. So partnership returns are due March 15th. Corporate proprietorship and fiduciary returns are due April 15th. And then there's also a seven month extension to file. So this is an extension to file and not pay. So the payment for these returns with the extension is due by the return due date, which I stated above. And then lastly, our estimate payments. So estimate payments for the business profits tax are equal to 25% of estimated tax liability and are due for a calendar year filers, April 15th, June 15th, so the first two payments are due in the, um, the end of a fiscal year, and then September 15th and December 15th for this third and fourth quarter estimates, and those estimate payments are required if an estimate liability exceeds $200. Moving on to the next slide. This information is pulled from our triangles, which is on the, the following slide, but it's a really good representation of our BPT taxpayers. So for tax year 2018, 1.4% of filers paid 85% of BPT. And then the next two charts below are showing who's filing and versus who's paying. So what's interesting about this slide is on the left, you'll see that the largest amount of entities that are filing business profits tax are proprietorships at 41%. However, looking onto the right, they only make up 3% of what is paid for BPT. And then to switch back over to who's filing, 6% of Water's Edge or combined filers 
are filing the tax, but they represent 62% of what is being paid through the BPT tax. And then on the next slide, this is the triangles, Representative Major, you allude to these a bit. These are located in our annual report. This is who pays the business profits tax. Um, and on the top, you'll see sort of that inverted triangle and that breaks out tax reported on the business profits tax. And then it has who, who files, the amount that they pay, and then it's um, some percentages based on that. And what's interesting with the business profits tax, if you look at that lower, smaller portion of the triangle, around 600 filers pay almost 80% of the business profits tax. So just an interesting slide um, showing who's filing and who's paying. And then this slide is the BBT revenue and the 10 year trend. This is audited revenue. So when we refer to audited revenue, that's coming out of the CAFR, which Chris talked about the comprehensive annual report. Um, on here, we have the 10 year trend in the blue and then we have fiscal year 21 plan with a dotted green line. On the right, we also give you a historical view of the BBT tax rates over the years. What's important to know on business profits tax is some factors that influence the revenue. This is located at the bottom of the slide. The economy, federal tax reform, mergers and acquisitions, credits and exemptions, and then statutory changes. So for instance, the business tax rate reduction, the trigger was not met on this, so the rate has remained at 7.7%. Seven .7%. And then we also have market-based sourcing in effect for taxable periods ending on or after December 31st, 2021, as well as single sales factor apportionment for taxable periods ending on or after December 31st, 2022. So I give a little bit more information about market-based sourcing. So for business profits, when they are reported prior to being taxed, they're apportioned. So portion, apportionment is split into two pieces. So we have intangible sales and services. So we switched from cost of performance where those intangible sales and services were apportioned based on where services were performed. And we switched now to market-based sourcing. And that's where those tangible, um, excuse me, those intangible sales and services are now apportioned to where the end customer is located. So that's the first change that just went into effect. And then the second change that will be going into effect for tax periods ending on or after December 31st, 2022 is for tangible items. So currently we use a three factor apportionment, meaning sales, property, and payroll with, sa with sales being double weighted are how the tangible items are apportioned. And when we switch to single sales factor, that means only sales will be factored in and apportioned and you can no longer include payroll and property. And I think that's it for business profits tax before we move on to business enterprise tax. So I'm happy to answer any questions here. Uh, let's see. Brad, I wanna pull up the participant list. You may need to click the um, participants button at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to the bottom of the screen and I, and I share. Okay, here we go. Let me move it out. Okay, if anybody has any questions, if they would raise their hands, and if they do, I'll see them on the participant screen. And I don't see any questions at this point in time. So we can continue. Perfect. All right, business enterprise tax. This is the second tax that makes up our total business taxes. The business enterprise tax is under RSA 77E. 
The current tax rate is 0.6% of the enterprise value tax base for taxable periods ending on or after December 31st, 2019. When we say enterprise value tax base, that consists of compensation and wages paid or accrued, as well as interest paid or accrued. Who pays this tax? Every profit or nonprofit enterprise or organization with any business activity inside New Hampshire, except 501c3 organizations. The thresholds on the business enterprise tax are a little bit different than the business profits tax as they are adjusted by CPI every two years. So currently for taxable periods ending January 1st, 2021, gross business receipts in excess of 220,000 or enterprise value tax base greater than 111,000. So the business enterprise tax has two different thresholds um, in either or need to be met. Also important to note is the credit for business enterprise tax against, there's a credit for the business enterprise tax against the business profits tax due. So if you pay the business enterprise tax and also have a liability on the business profits tax, you deduct what you paid for business enterprise tax off of and this tax is also carry forward any unused credit for 10 years and then when to file or pay the business profits tax and the business enterprise tax come in on the same return with a sort of a cover sheet that's called the bt summary and so the due dates for the enterprise tax mirror the due dates for the business profits tax with the exception of nonprofits who are not required to file the business profits tax. Those are due on May 15th. All right, this slide should look familiar to you, except it's for the business enterprise tax and it's slightly different. You'll see that 3.9% of filers pay 73.9% of that. So it's spread out a little bit more. However, some of the trends are the same. Again, proprietorships are filing more, yet they're paying only 7% of the tax. And again, Water's Edge are filing 6%, but they're paying 53% of the business enterprise tax. Going on to the next, so the triangles again, this is in our annual report, um, pretty similar except I'm looking at that bottom of the triangle again, and 268 taxpayers pay 43% of the tax. So not quite as drastic as the business profits tax. Moving on, and here is the business enterprise revenue 10 year trend. Again, you can see some dips and some spikes. Um, factors influencing the business enterprise tax are the economic cycle including employment levels and wages, which makes sense because it's taxed on wages and compensation, federal tax reform, credits and exemptions, and then any statutory changes, which for the business enterprise tax was the business tax rate, which again, the trigger was not met, and then the adjustment of the thresholds every two years. And then, here is a combined slide. So again, we typically report the BET and BPT together. Um, it just makes sense because they kind of go hand in hand and they flow together on one return. So this just shows the trend with them together as well as the fiscal year 21 plan. And again, you can see some peaks, which are in some of those areas are due to some mergers and acquisitions and some anomalous payments. And then we sort of dip down. So in 16, you see it peaks up because of those situations that I just stated. It drops back down in 17, which would sort of have been the trend if it continued. And then in 18 and 19, you see it peak back up and that's due to some federal tax reform. And then it's dropped back down for fiscal year 20. Moving on to the next slide. So this is just an interesting slide to keep handy. Um, I know there's a lot of information on it, but what we really wanted to show on this slide is how calendar year filers compare to state fiscal year filers, because it can get a little bit confusing when listening to our fiscal notes and the fiscal impact because they don't necessarily align. So in the top chart, you can see on the left-hand side that 2019 returns that were due fall outside of fiscal year 21. And then when you shift to, to the right-hand side on this top box for calendar year filers, 
you'll see that third quarter estimate payments as well as 2019 returns on extension in the fourth quarter estimate payments fall within the first half of fiscal year 21. So essentially what it shows is that tax years overlap fiscal years. So in a fiscal year, you have multiple tax years flowing into one fiscal year. And you can see that on the bottom that fiscal year 2021 is made up of 2019 as well as 2020 returns and um, 2021 estimate payments. So when, we're, when they're implementing tax laws, those tax laws may and are typically for calendar years, but they do impact multiple fiscal years. So just a good chart to have handy when we're talking about calendar year and fiscal year. And we can go to the next slide. And I'm gonna go through the next couple of slides fairly quickly because you're, you should be familiar with them because Lindsay had talked about them in the previous um, presentation. So this one again is just showing the impact of our diff different payment types. So we have tax return payments, estimate payments, extension payments, and then tax notice payments and refunds. And I think what's important to note on this slide is that estimates make up the bulk of the payments that are coming in. And it shows a good trend of, of how those payments flow in and how they contract and expand or decrease. The next slide, this just breaks down business tax estimates, uh, just shows the entities that pay the estimates um, and the bulk of estimates that come in, the bulk of the revenue is from corporations. And then partnerships, proprietorships with a small amount being paid by fiduciaries. On the next slide. All right, I think that's it for business taxes. Are there any questions? If not, we can move to meals and rooms tax. I do have a question. No, I was bad. I, uh, for some if reason- If you have I, a question, please- I know, I know my hand icon, my, hand. My, my, my raised hand icon doesn't work. Mine doesn't either. It's true for me too. Oh, okay. We were trying, so- Brad, Brad do you under, why is that, Brad? Brad, because what will happen, everybody wants to talk at once. Uh, my apologies, Representative Major, I, uh, I, was, I was on the other line. Um, Why is it that a raised hand function does not work? Okay. Um, Who is trying to raise their hand? Uh, Representative Romney is one of them. It was Ames and Tucker as well that I heard. It should be um, at the bottom of their screen, or yep. it could be at the bottom of the participants list. No, I know because of someone is sharing their screen, you may need to go up to view options and then select um, exit full screen. Oh, wait a minute. View option. Excuse me. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be on the screen at all. There's just invite and mute me. Well, they have a raised hand, it just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. because it's in full screen, you would need to select view options at the top of the screen and then, and then select exit full screen and it will appear at the bottom of your screen. The, the icon is there, but it's not uh, responding. Huh. Well, maybe we can just hold up our hands while they figure this out. For some reason it worked for me, but huh. I'm a co-host, so. Host again. You, can you help us out on this? I, I don't know any. I, I know it's working for me, I, as you can see, but. What I'm finding, not to interrupt, but what I'm finding is if you go to the participants, click on that, click on the panelists, and then you'll have the option. That's the only way I'm getting it. I've got the option, but it's not responding. Hello. <laughs> Uh, I just shot a email to Lindsay. I mean, a text to Lin not Lindsay. Um, excuse me, Jen. For okay, I raised my hand, but it it's not showing, right. and I don't want to raise my hand. 
Yeah, because it's a disaster if we can't have this function working. Because we don't see any, uh, we have the screen shared, you don't see any of the participants. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll stop sharing my screen and see if that helps. Okay. Still not working on my end. Pat. That's all. The same problem. Huh. Allow attendees to raise hand. That's been checked. We can just hold up our hand. I guess if we're, in, if we're in this mode, we can just raise our hands like this, Norm. Just, and you can pick them. Right. I only see you and about four others. You got to go to full screen. You got to go to full. Um, Gallery. I think they at least come up to the top of the list. If you want to look at the four that are at the top, maybe. Okay, why don't we do that? So at the top of the list is Representative Tucker. So Representative Tucker. Thank you. I have a question about uh, the slide that talks about the floor that's established for the business enterprise tax. And uh, does that change very often? Has it changed very often, the amount? Yes, great question, Representative Tucker. Can you guys hear me better now? Oh, yes. All right, I, may, I was able to make some changes while you had some discussion, so thank you. Um, so yeah, so it changes every two years and since it's been in place, it has increased every two years. So I think for the last six years or so, um, it's adjusted. So it's every two years. So I think it's adjusted three times since being implemented. So do you, th is it fairly incremental or a percentage? Yep, so it's, it's we based on- We spend a lot of time as a group talking about who ought to be exempted or who should have things lowered. But I hadn't really real thought about that floor and how that probably helps mom and pops enterprises and so forth. So that's why I'm asking, is it uh, sort of an automatic incremental change or is it thoughtful to direct itself to a problem? Um, I think it's thought thoughtful. It's directed by the statute. So there's a formula within the statute that requires DRA to adjust it based on CPI, the average increase of CPI over the last completed um, calendar year. So it's, it's based on the growth, obviously, in the economy. So that, I think it's a thoughtful um, statute that's put in there, and it's, it's very descriptive in telling DRA how to calculate the increase. Okay, the next is representative. Thank Representative you. Bromley, followed by Representative Clark. Yeah, mine's more of a comment. Uh, we, when we were talking about BPP, when we were talking about market-based sourcing and single sales factor, there's, uh, I'm introducing a bill on Thursday that we actually worked through last year um, on, on both those issues. It's a very important issue to be the last bill of, of the day on Thursday. And I think DRA will, will also be there to be part of this discussion. Thank you. Then Representative Clark. Amanda. I do not have any. Yeah, I don't have a question. Okay. The next one would be Representative Ames. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a question about the uh, division of revenues between BET and BBT. And I wonder if you could run through exactly how you allocate the revenues between those two taxes. At what point can we know that it's uh, it's a final allocation? At what, what points is it an estimate? And how do you how do you do it? Great question, Representative Ames. So the I'm going to explain how we were historically doing it, and then we've made some changes recently. So 
historically, the way the business enterprise tax and business profits tax is split is on, we do it on a monthly basis, but it's not based on the actual split that we are familiar with, with what the tax payer will be filing. It's based on historical numbers. So for example, when we're getting estimate payments flowing into the department on the form, it's split between BET and PPT. However, most taxpayers just put the total business tax that they're paying. They don't necessarily split it out between the two taxes because as I stated before, the returns come in on one form, one summary form with the two taxes below. So most taxpayers view it as one tax when they're paying their enterprise value tax and their business profits tax. However, we need to split this between business profits tax and business enterprise tax, because as Chris spoke to, it does get split separately between the general fund and education trust fund. So typically this is done based on the last completed fiscal year or two years prior to the last completed fiscal year. So as of July 1st, every year, the department sets the business profits tax and inter business enterprise tax split based on two prior fiscal years. So the split is then performed at the end of every month to fully split out those taxes. So we always recommend don't look at the BET and BPT amounts throughout the month because they're just flowing in and they're, they're sort of offset. But when you get to the end of the month, we do a transfer to put the funds into the appropriate account based on that historical split. Okay, Representative Bernstein. Oh. Well, I don't think she's finished. Yeah, so I just wanted to add one more piece. So now because of the implementation of RIMS, so starting in October, we've been able to do a little bit better job on that split. So the payments that come in that are not split between BET and P BPT are still based on historical amounts. However, if they do come in with a split, we put them into the appropriate account. And then when you come in March and April and those returns are filed, those returns will true up those estimates that were based on a historical split to be the actual split. So I think coming this March and April, it's the first time that we're going to have true accurate splits between BET and BBT um, based on the most recent data received. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a lot to kind of throw out there. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Representative Bernstein? I, I do not have a question right now. Okay. Um, Representative Elmy, did you have a question? Yes. I was trying to figure out, since I'm at the top, I don't know how whether I've managed to, to ask or not. <laughs> but um, I'm, I want to go back to what Representative Tucker was asking about, because uh, you and I were actually there at the time. It was during the O'Brien administration. And on... Um, there was a bill that came in to say that um, the amount of the floor should be doubled for the BET. And I thought that was awful and I went and analyzed it. And in fact, the, in order to reach the same level after inflation, we did need to double it, but that was kind of a shock to the system. So I asked that we put in the CPI indicator so that it would rise gradually rather than all at once. And uh, they, we did that, all of us. <laughs> but um, so that's, how, that's why that's in there. And it's kind of, I think, important in tax policy, the problem of floors. Thank you. Okay, is there any others that had a question? Then um, we can continue on the meals and rooms. Good morning, Chairman, members of the committee. This is Devin Roderick, financial analyst of the Department of Revenue. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, yes, yes. Great. So the meals and rentals tax is a 9% tax on meals, rooms, and motor vehicle rentals. It is paid by the consumer and collected and remitted by operators of hotels, restaurants, and motor vehicle rental establishments, et cetera. For operators meeting certain criteria like filing returns timely and paying on time, they are allowed to retain a commission of 3%. Returns are filed monthly for MNR 
and are due by the 15th of each following month. As Chris Shea mentioned earlier, during December, we received returns and payments for activity that occurred in November. Operators are able to file electronically using Grant Tax Connect, our online taxpayer portal, which went live in October 2019, and Lindsay will go into a little more later. A paper return is not required if filing the return. Um, <clears throat> sorry, one second. So the, the gross meals and rentals tax liability reported by activity type. So from on average from fiscal year 2016 to fiscal year 2020, historically MNR revenue consists of 80% meals, 17% rooms and 3% motor vehicle. This has been pretty consistent over time. On the following slide, we'll look at this breakdown by county for fiscal year 2020. The top portion of this slide shows how much MR tax liability was reported in each county, as well as how much each county represents of all MR revenue collected statewide. The chart is organized left to right based on how much was reported in fiscal year 2020. It's important to note at this point, as it relates to the data on this slide, that the DRA does not collect information on exactly where MNR tax revenue is generated. Rather, the data in these charts represents the revenue collected based on the address of the operator. The reporting location is often different than the location where the taxable transaction occurred and where MNR tax was actually collected. Many MNR operators, for example, file their returns on a consolidated basis meaning the operator reports the MR tax collected from several business locations on a single return. Another example might be mobile businesses who may be collecting tax throughout the, throughout the state on different, different counties. The lower portion of this slide answers a question from the last presentation by Representative Tucker, who was interested in the breakdown by county. Remember from the previous slide, the statewide breakdown is on average is 80% meal, 17% rooms and 3% motor vehicle. This chart is organized. You can see in the blue column from left to right, which counties have a higher percentage of meals activity. You'll notice that the counties to the far right, the first of three of which are from the North Country, have a much higher percentage of rooms than the statewide average. For example, Coas County being 47% of rooms versus the statewide average of just 17%. And likewise, all the way to the left, Stratford County has only 9%. This really speaks to the differences in the types of businesses per county across the state. <clears throat> the next slide. This is the familiar 10 year trend of audited revenue per the CAFR. Um, you'll see the, the trend for the past 10 years in the blue line, and you'll notice the dip in FY 2020. Factors influenced in MNR tax include COVID-19, as can be seen in the chart above. Um, when the economy is thriving, MNR tax revenue is usually increasing. Unemployment rates also affect this tax by weighing down consumer spending. The weather also plays a factor and correlates with travel and tourism, which was obviously affected during the last year. Generally, favorable weather conditions during the summer and winter can positively affect MNR as well as strong foliage seasons. Are there any questions on the MNR tax at this point? Okay. Any questions? Uh, we'll try this participant list again. I don't see any hands raised, but uh, if you do have a question, just speak up. Let's see if we can do it. Pat, um, it's just a clarifying thing for the new members, just to make sure when they say 3% goes to the uh, organization co collecting the revenue, that's 3% of what's collected, not 3% of the 9%. <laughs> Sometimes it could be a little confusing, but it's 3% it's of what's collected. Just in case anybody was confused. And that total amount for fiscal year 2020 was 9 million across the entire state. Uh, this is on... Uh... Sue, I guess we're on first name at the moment. Uh, on the the three percent is meant to compensate for the administrative costs of collecting our tax and sending it in, and they're much higher than that, I think, for the smallest enterprises, and lower than that for the chains. So it's mostly credit costs. 
in the in the past there's been legislation to eliminate this to, to raise our revenue but uh, it's never gotten anywhere and I, I think it works okay the way it is and no other questions and we can move on to the tobacco tax Uh, who's speaking on the tobacco tax? I think it's Melissa. Melissa, are you taking? Yeah, I yes, I was on mute. I apologize. <laughs> All right, tobacco tax. This is under RSA seventy eight. This one is made up of a couple different components. So for one portion of the tax, it's based on stamp. So it's a dollar seventy eight per pack of twenty cigarettes, or two dollars and twenty three per pack of twenty five cigarettes. And then the other portion of the tobacco tax is the other tobacco products or OTP as we refer to them. And those are 65.03% of the wholesale sales price for all other tobacco products except e-cigarettes. For e-cigarettes, I believe Lindsay covered this in the, the last presentation, e-cigarette tax went into effect on January 1st of last year. It's levied on both the closed system and open system and is reported on the OTP return. The closed system tax is a rate of 0 0.30 0 per a milliliter on the volume of the liquid of other substance containing nicotine in the cartridge or container. And the other in the open system is 8% of the wholesale price of the container of liquid or other substance. So again, it's the 30 cents per milliliter on um, for the closed systems and then 8% on the wholesale price of the container of liquid for the open systems. It's important to note premium cigars are exempt from the tobacco tax. The tax on tobacco products is a direct tax upon the consumer at retail, but it's prepaid or excuse me, pre-collected and paid by the wholesaler. For packs of 20 or 25 cigarettes, payment of the tax is evidenced by the wholesaler's purchase of tobacco tax stamps, which are affixed to each package. So essentially, the wholesaler comes to the department, buys the stamps for the cigarettes. They pay the tax at that point. They put the stamp on the package of the cigarettes. Those are then sold to the retailers who and who are then passed on the consumer and the consumer is paying it within the price. However, it's initially paid by the wholesaler. So for cigarettes sold in, in packages or quantities other than 20 or 25, not suitable for stamping, and for OTP, the other tobacco products, which is essentially loose tobacco or chewing tobacco, um, the wholesaler must be reported in and pay the tax liability on the monthly basis. This is paid similar to the MNR tax. The return and payment of the tax are due on or before the 15th day of the month following the end of the reporting period. And then just the last piece of this that is important to note because it's in our reports as well, stamps may be purchased on a bond filed with the department. So meaning these wholesalers receive a bond they purchase their stamp on bond and then they have 30 days to pay that bond off. So some of the tobacco stamps are paid with cash and others are paid on bond, which is received 30 days later. Uh, next slide. So for tobacco tax, for fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 20, on average tobacco tax revenue were composed primarily of cigarette stamps sales. So that's 94% of the revenue is coming from cigarettes and then 6% is coming from OTP. And you'll see on future slides that the OTP portion of the tobacco tax, although small has continued to grow um, pretty regularly over each year. And this breakdown again, um, you had seen in prior presentations, but we wanted to sort of put it all into one place. This is the tobacco stamp revenue, what it looks like. And you can see that the peaks and valleys sort of cor correspond with the rate increase and decrease that are to the left. And then OTP. This is a chart that you've seen before, but again, as I spoke to, you can see that the percentage or the dollars of OTP have pretty consistently gained year over year with fiscal year 20 being the highest so far and the rates are on the are on the left as well.
So for tobacco tax revenue, this is the 10 year trend. You can see that it's kind of increased and decreased. We show some rates to help follow those increases and decreases over the year. You can see that fiscal year 21 plan um, is close to what fiscal year 19 audited revenue ended at. And you can see fiscal year 20 um, has been performing pretty well, as well as that trend is continuing through fiscal year 21. Factors that influence that revenue is cross-border elasticity, e-cigarettes, stamp sales trend, as well as, again, Lindsay spoke about this in the last presenta presentation, the Massachusetts ban on mentholated products that went into effect June 1st, 2020. Um, we've seen a pretty big gain in fiscal year 21 based on um, their, their tax law change. So this is a newer slide, but we found it to be interesting based on some of the questions that the representatives had during the um, economic briefing presentation. What this shows on the left is tobacco tax rates by state. So this has the tax rate per pack. Um, so New Hampshire's $1.78 highlighted in blue, and we rank 26th for the um, highest level or lowest level, however you want to say it for tax rates. And then these are our nearby states and you can see they increase pretty dramat dramatically from Maine being the closest to us at $2 per pack with New York being the highest at 435 per pack. So this does show that there is a pretty, a pretty good um, range between what we have assessed versus what our, our local New England states have assessed. And then on the right, um, just some more interesting facts. The, the ranking of smuggled cigarettes consumed as a percentage of total cigarettes consumed in 20, 2018, both of these informations are not DRA informations. I should have stated that in the beginning. Um, this is from Tax Foundation. We have the lowest rate of smuggled cigarettes consumed as a percentage of total consumed within the state. So we rank 47, so way down of the amount of smuggled cigarettes into New Hampshire that are consumed. Um, sort of the inverse of this is we have, we are one of the highest um, states that are smuggled out of because of our lower tax rate. And I think that is it for the tobacco tax slide. So happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions on the tobacco tax? Uh uh, Representative Major, could I ask uh, about this slide itself? Does that tax rate include the sales tax, which I think all of them put on top? No, great question, Representative Almi. I should have stated that. This does not. So this is just the straight tax rate and does not include the sales tax that is also assessed by these states on the tax. Good catch. So in Massachusetts, I, I think, has what, about 6% tax? Yeah, making that even a larger range. Yeah, more than double ours. All right, uh, anything, any other questions to speak up or we'll try that? Yeah, just comment that Mass, um, advertisers in Massachusetts are now uh, congratulating. Represent, that, that's representing your early Go ahead, Representative Newley. I'm sorry, getting used to this again. You may have noticed that um, um, tobacco shop operators uh, further south in Massachusetts are advertising and they're including the thanks to the uh, legislature in Massachusetts for sending their customers to New Hampshire. Yes. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, we can move on to real estate transfer tax. The real, estate, the real estate transfer tax or RET is a tax on the sale, granting and transfer of real property or interest in real property. It is imposed at a rate of 75 cents per $100 of the price or consideration for the sale, granting or transfer on both the buyer and the seller in each transaction. RET is paid by buying stamps, which are affixed to the deed from the register of deeds in the county where the property is located. Um, each register of deeds remits the taxes collected to the DRA on a monthly basis, and it retains 4% of the face value of the stamps sold in the county. 
In real estate holding company transactions, the tax is remitted directly to the department. Next slide. This chart shows the average percentage of transactions and percentage of overall tax collected per county in fiscal year 2020. It's interesting to note the trends are not always the same. For instance, Grafton County had 14.4% of the transactions, but only represented about 6.4% of the revenue. Conversely, at the same time, Rockingham County had 19.8% of the number of transactions and represented 28.7% of the revenue collected statewide. So this is here for your reference as well. Next slide. Here you'll see the familiar 10 year audited revenue trend per the CAFR. The current um, rent tax rate, like I explained a minute ago, in total $1.50 per $100 um, dollars of the price of consideration or transfer, which includes both the purchaser and the seller. That was in effect throughout this time frame. So you can see the rent tax has been gradually increasing over the last 10 years. It is influenced by economic trends, including mortgage interest rates, which are currently at historically low levels. Property values obviously heavily influence rent revenue as we've seen over the last year. A couple of figures from the New Hampshire Realtors Association, the median sales price in December, 2020 was up 16.6% for single family homes on the previous December and uh, townhouse condo properties are up 23.5% from a year ago. Available inventory of real estate for sale also influences this tax. Again, as of December, inventory had decreased 62% for single family homes and 47% for townhouse condo properties from a year prior. Lastly, over the last year, there's been a continued shift in demographics from urban to more rural areas as many people being shift away from the more um, heavily populated densities, which will help increase net migration in Hampshire and uh, presumably have a positive influence on the real estate transfer tax. We've seen that over the last year. Are there any questions on the real estate transfer tax? Okay, questions. Uh, speak up. Don't see it here anybody. So we'll go on to interest and dividend tax. All right, interest and dividends tax. This is under RSA 77. It's a 5% tax on interest and dividend, dividends income. Who pays it is all New Hampshire residents, fiduciaries, LLCs, partnerships, and associations with income from interest and dividends. The threshold for this tax is 2,400 annually, or if you file jointly, it's 4,800. There's also an exemption with this tax of 1,200 for residents age 65 or older, blind or disabled before their 65th birthday. This, this tax is due on April 15th. This tax also has a seven month extension similar to the business profits and business enterprise tax, which is due April 15th with the return being due seven months later. And it also has estimate requirements. So the estimates equal to 25% of estimated tax liability. The due dates are April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, which those fall in line with the business taxes. However, the fourth quarter estimate payment for interest and dividends tax is due January 15th of the subsequent year. So this month is an IND estimate tax month for their fourth quarter estimate payment. And they're only required to make estimates if their liability exceeds $500. So again, we have some pictures of how IND taxpayers file for tax year 2018. On the left, we have entities paying interest and dividends tax. 98.3% of the filers for interest and dividends tax are individuals and joint filers, with the remaining 1.7% for partnerships and estates. And then we have a little comment below where the entities that are uh, filing the tax, the above is paying, um, is pretty similar with 97 Point, actually, it's basically the same 97.3 and then 2.66 for partnerships in estimates. What's interesting on this slide on the right is interest in dividends tax broken down by the areas of what is taxed. So although it's called interest in dividends tax, there are a few other items that make up this tax with interest being 13% of the tax 
dividends being 40% of the taxed federal tax exempt interest is 7.7% or 8% of the tax. And then there's distributions and distributions is about 39% of the tax. This does shift over the years. Um, and especially I think you would, you would note that interest does increase or de decrease based on what the interest rate is at. On the next slide, we have the triangles again that are from our annual report. Not as exciting as the business profits tax and business enterprise tax triangles. You'll see in the middle here, 40% um, of the tax is paid by about 23% of the people filing. So this tax is split out a little bit more evenly than the business profits and business enterprise tax. On the next slide, we have interest and dividends tax revenue for the 10 year trend. You'll see over the prior earlier years on this tax, there are some peaks and valleys. And then for the last four or five years, it's consistently increased. Some factors that can that influence this revenue is obviously the economy, stock market performance, interest rates, federal tax reform, or people who have money in the bank. Happy to answer any questions on the IND tax. Okay, any questions on the IND tax? Uh, since we, the raise hand function isn't working, uh, let's try just picking up. Um, it's Representative Almy again. I, I must admit, I don't really understand what a distribution is. Can you clarify that? I don't think we looked at this until a few years ago. Sure, so distributions, um, an example of a distribution would be a distribution from maybe an LLC or a partnership or an association would be subject to the tax. So if they pay that distribution out to a corporate shareholder, um, it would be taxed as a dividend, but if they are paying it out um, to an individual, it's a distribution. So it's split a little bit differently than a dividend. Carolyn or Lindsay, you can feel free to jump in if we need some more clarification. Okay. Uh, anything else on that? If not, other questions? Sam, not, we can go over the communication services tax. The communication services tax, or CST, is a 7% tax on all two way communication services. It's paid by the consumer and collected by two-way communication service providers who are required to collect and tax, uh, collect the tax and file a return. Those returns are due on the 15th day of the following month. However, estimate payments are required during each month if the tax liability is over 10,000. Next slide. Here's a 10 year trend again of audited revenue it's important to note that in 2012, Chapter 279 added definitions of internet and internet access and excluded them from the definition of communication services. <clears throat> also over time, there's a decrease in landlines, which has contributed to a decrease in the revenue, as well as modern pricing and purchasing trends for wireless communications. And lastly, uh, HB4 of 2019 clarified that retailers of prepaid wireless and VoIP must assess and collect the CST. Are there any questions about CST? Questions on the communication services tax. I have to speak up again. Um, Representative Almy again, could you tell us whether you're having success in getting the VoIP and video conferencing people to pay? Good question. I'm going to Defer to Lindsay and Carolyn. Or I'll jump in there. I think I mentioned last week that we were looking into that um, and we will be doing some auditing and some proactive outreach. Obviously, it's only been a few days since that time. So it, that process is still underway. Thank you, sir. Sure, no worries. Just to follow up on that, has, have you uh, interfaced at all with a Zoom organization? 
Um, I can't talk about any interactions with specific taxpayers, unfortunately, given um, our confidentiality statutes, but obviously the Zoom platform is a very well-known um, video conferencing platform. So um, they, we are aware of the uh, functionality that they provide. Okay, <laughs> follow-up question on that is, how about any platform that performs this? Have you interfaced with them? So obviously there are multiple platforms. Um, Zoom, the state uses Microsoft Teams. We've also used, utilized the WebEx platform. Um, and so again, those are all um, taxpayers or businesses that um, we would be looking to in terms of um, determining whether or not they owe communication services. Do you know, do you know if any other states have uh, collected from them? I'm not aware specifically of any other state. It would depend on their specific um, tax uh, policies, and if they had an equivalent communication services tax, I'm not. I'm not sure if other states have a similar tax. Okay, so we have some work to do. We do, and I mentioned that last week that you know this is something that we are aware of and that we are looking into. All right. Any further questions or comments on the communication services tax? Here and none, we can go to the Medicaid enhancement tax. All right, Medicaid enhancement tax, otherwise known as MET. This is under RSA 84A. This tax is a little bit different as it is a restricted revenue source. So this isn't a tax that you estimate revenues on, um, but we do administer it. So we wanted to cover it. So the Medicaid enhancement tax is 5.4% tax upon net patient service revenue of hospital. It's paid by general hospitals that provide inpatient and outpatient hospital services and not including government facil facilities. The way this is taxed and the reporting period is a little bit different than our other periods. The tax period for MET is a 12 month period running on a fiscal year, July 1st, ending June 30th. And the tax due is based on the hospital's fiscal year ending during the calendar year in which the taxable period began. So just as an example, right now we are in the MET taxable period ending June 30th, 2021. And that will be reported for hospitals period end dates that ended in 2020. So how MET is filed and paid? One difference with MET is that each hospital must file a non-binding estimate on or before January 15th. And this is a projected tax payment. So it's just an informational estimate payment that tells us what they anticipate their tax to be due when the return is due in April 15th. So in April 15th, they file and pay that MET return. On the next slide, we have a picture of MET historical revenue or their historical trends. And this is cash basis net of refunds. So you can see that it has gradually increased and uh, fiscal year 20 is, fiscal year 21 plan is close to fiscal year 20 actual revenue. And below we have some of the rates over the previous years. And then lastly, factors that influence revenue is obviously hospital service utilization. The more people in the hospital, the more tax that is, is paid. And then the last slide that we have for MET is just to give you our role in the MET administration because it's a little bit different where it's a dual role between DRA and DHHS. So the hospitals file the non-binding estimate with us on January 15th. So we just received most of those estimates. They file that with the DRA. And then once we have all the estimates in, we notify uh, DHHS of the estimated payments. We also notify House Ways and Means and Senate Ways and Means. So you'll be getting a letter on that here in the next coming week or so. 100% um, of the MET owed is due to the DRA on or before April 15th. So we received those, retur we received those returns and those payments, and then we deposit those funds into the uncompensated care and Medicaid fund established by RSA 167 colon 64. Again, that's into a restricted revenue account. Lastly, the commissioner of DHHS is responsible for expending those funds in accordance with RSA 167 colon 64. And this is for what you'll hear as termed the dish payment. So it's a dish proportionate share hospital payment 
and other Medicaid expenditures. So just at a very high level, the MET money flows in from the hospitals. The hospitals report that they get, or the, excuse me, let me start over. The money flows in from the hospitals. We report that to DHHS. We get some matching funds from the federal government and then the hospitals get some of that money back in what's termed a dish payment. Lastly, DRA is authorized to audit MET returns and we can also collect unpaid MET. Happy to answer any questions in MET. Questions on Medicaid enhancement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is Representative Ames. Yep. Yes, Representative Ames. Okay. Um, yeah, when I first came in to uh, Ways and Means eight or nine years, nine years ago, we were uh, actively uh, reviewing the MET um, and estimating um, revenues from it. That changed, it became a restricted fund. I understand that. But what I don't understand is why Ways and Means is not uh, estimating going forward on what is in fact a very large revenue stream. And uh, I'm not sure anyone else is doing that other than the hospitals. Am I right about that? Maybe um, there are others who could answer this question better, but uh, I'll, I'll just throw it out there. I think Chris Shea might be able to answer that. Chris? Yep, um, I can try. So typically the role, <clears throat> excuse me, the role of the committee has been to deal with just the unrestricted revenue estimates. You have many, many, many restricted revenues in the state um, that you don't address directly. The legislature through RSA has given authority to an entity to collect and distribute the revenue. Unlike the general fund unrestricted revenue, which doesn't get appropriated until you build the budget. So I, I think there may be some distinction with you've already provided some authority to entities to spend money that's been collected. So you don't need to do the estimates. They're bound by um, rules and laws that say you, your estimates need to meet your expenses. If your expenses exceed any revenue, then you need to reduce your, um, basically your appropriation for that restricted revenue. In the terms of um, the MET, that was uh, three, or three or four budgets ago, that was changed from a general fund unrestricted revenue to a restricted revenue within HHS. And as Melissa described, it's used for the, the dish or just put a proportionate share to hospitals where um, basically they make up for some of the uncompensated care that they um, have provided. And then if there's anything left, the department is able to use that towards provider payments after they've taken care of the, the dish aspect. Um, but yeah, that's the best answer I have for you, Representative Ames, is that um, typically the those restricted funds have uh, the ability and statute to be expended, collected and expended already, whereas the unrestricted don't. That's taken care of through your operating budget and passing that piece of legislation. And, and Chris, how many, <clears throat> what is the approximate number of unrestricted funds that I mean, restricted funds are there out there. So your, your dedicated funds, you have in excess of, there's been over 350 dedicated funds created over the years. Not all of those still exist. Some of those are repealed um, over the years. They don't reuse the same number, but you have dedicated funds or restricted funds in almost every agency. Um, for one reason or another, um, the legislature has agreed that um, a particular revenue stream should be dedicated for a certain purpose and has provided that in the statute. Restricted funds are not um, funds that agencies just decide to keep and, and do what they want with. There's, there's direction provided in statute for them to use that money. But yeah, the, so there's probably somewhere over 300 that are active or ha are still in existence, I should say, because not all dedicated funds are necessarily active. They're just, they may be sitting there dormant. Um, and your committee, Ways and Means Committee, does look at that um, periodically. You look at the dedicated funds and, and make determinations on what should happen with those. Right. There's a separate committee. It's a joint committee to look at that every year to see which ones are active or inactive, which ones should be done away with. And our committee will be handling legislation this year as a result of that committee. 
Hey, Norm, it's Pat. Norm? Yes. Can I speak up? Uh, yeah, I've, I've consulted in hospitals for 43 years, so I know a little something about this tax. Uh, it's it, When we say net revenues, it's not profit. First off, people hear net revenue, they think it's profit. In hospitals, uh, gross charges is what you see as the, in their in their uh, revenue per type of procedure, but it's really net. The net is the net of that uh, after contractual. So Blue Cross sees the charges, but if, let's say a chest X-ray is on their on their books a hundred dollars, but Blue Cross is only going to pay fifty dollars. So that is the contractual difference. So the net in this is really the net charges, not not the net profit. I, I just wanted to clarify that. And it's really what this whole program is designed to do is to help the hospitals with high Medicaid populations. It's very hard to survive with very high Medicaid prop, uh, uh, populations. So it, it basically, and, and self-pay patients. So those hospitals out of this fund will get more, more revenue as the dish payment that was described than those hospitals in a, in a good uh, setting like my hospital, Exeter hospitals in a very good setting there's not much much uh free care and all that so uh so that's what the program is about that's all thank you very good uh any further questions or comments on the medicaid enhancement question chairman yes uh, who's that jim murphy representative murphy go ahead uh just a question maybe they can answer is my question is, have we seen a significant drop in the uh, uh, MET payments because of COVID? I know that a lot of hospital utiliz utilizations are way down. And the other question I had is, what percentage of the MET payment coming in gross is actually going back in dish payments to the contributing hospitals? And has that declined over the years since its inception in the early 90s? Great, great question, Representative Murphy. So for payments, um, so as I stated before, what's due this month are the January 15th non-binding estimate payments, were which is based on the hospital's fiscal year ending 2020. So those are flowing in as we speak. So we'll have official numbers probably next week or by the end of this week to let you know how much they've decreased, but we do anticipate a decrease based on uh, the COVID situation and how the hospitals have been struggling some. As for the percentage of MET payments out of DISH, I don't have that answer because uh, DHHS is the one who's responsible for the DISH payments, but we could probably reach out to them and get you some information on historical DISH payments being made. My, 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 the reason for that second question was that my understanding when this initially came out was that the MET payment was made by the hospitals it, the federal was a one-to-one -one match on it, and it was supposed to go back, basically, you know, keeping the hospitals whole with regard to the MET payment. And my experience is that that has actually decreased over time, uh, meaning the money's going back to the hospitals. I just wonder if that trend is continuing. Sure, we'll get you some information on that. Thank you. Representative Major, this is Chris. Just to um, let the committee know, the Department of Health and Human Services is speaking to you this afternoon. So I can email Karen rounds to just um, maybe have some information related to the Met and the distribution of that. Good, because um, they're going to be speaking to us at 1.30 this afternoon. All right, any further questions or comments on Medicaid enhancement tax? If not, the next is nursing facility quality assessment. Thank you. So the Nursing Facility Quality Assessment, or NFQA, is a 5.5% tax upon the net patient services revenue on all nursing facilities on the basis of patient days in each facility. The assessment is paid by the nursing facilities as well as facilities licensed as a specialty hospital and certified to receive federal reimbursement as a nursing facility. NFQA is assessed quarterly with returns due on the 10th of the month following the quarter in payment if via check is due on the 15th. If facilities are paying electronically, they do have until the end of the month to pay. Those facilities can now file again through Granite Tax Connect as well. <clears throat> this is a 10 year trend of NFQA based on unaudited cash. The current five and a half percent rate applied to all years in this chart. 
Um, and it is influenced by nursing home utilization. Next slide. Nursing facilities file their quarterly returns with both the DRA and HHS. They typically pay their assessment due by electronic funds transfer. And it's important to note that the NFQA revenue is deposited directly into the nursing facility trust fund. So again, much like MET, this assessment does not go into the general education trust funds. As outlined there, um, the commissioner of HHS is responsible for expending funds in accordance with RSA 151-E colon 15. The monies in the fund shall be used to eliminate or reduce to the maximum extent possible, the difference between the allowable Medicaid costs derived from the nursing facility Medicaid acuity rate setting system, which nursing facilities incur in providing care to Medicaid residents, and the amount which the state has budgeted in order to fund that care. DRA is authorized, much like Matt, to audit NFQA returns and collect unpaid NFQA liability. Are there any questions on NFQA? Yeah, I would have thought that on your 10 year trend that they would have seen some effect of the pandemic on FY20 revenues. If not, is it going to be sh show up in FY21 and what your anticipation? Um, currently the um, NFQA um, for FY2021, again, right now NFQA um, facilities are paying their third, uh, their second quarter um, payments, which are due by the end of this month. But currently NFQA um, is 8.9% above prior fiscal year at this point, and 16.5% um, below fiscal year 2021 plan. But again, I'd caution those numbers, we haven't seen all of the revenue come in for January at this point. Um, we'll know more as the fiscal year goes on, I guess, but as of right now, it doesn't seem to be too affected by, by the care um, provided by nursing facilities. That begs another question is, uh, how's the occupancy rate on these nursing facilities? Has that been decreasing? That's not something that we have, but we'd be more, more than happy to look into that for you and get back to the committee on. Okay. Norm, Norm can I make a, a comment, please? Representative Romney. Yeah, just to, just for the members, uh, every 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 county has a county home uh, that we that we're responsible for overseeing in the budget and et cetera. So this is just be aware that this this affects our county homes very much. So I'll, let's throw that out as a comment. Uh, any further Thank questions you. or comments? Uh, this is Representative Elmy. Representative Elmy. Thank you. On um, th there was. A few years back, back when this got started, it's essentially another Medicaid type thing where you're transferring money from the nursing homes that have more paying customers to the nursing homes that aren't getting sufficient money from the state to make up, uh, which would include our county homes. On um, and. Uh, there was a big fight going on in the early days about the continuing care facilities, which have nursing home sections within them, but have signed a, um, a pledge that they will not have any of their members go on to Medicaid. Uh, so they have no chance of recuperating anything from it. And can you tell us which, um, with, who, which side won that fight? I'm going that to, is, the, the continuing cares did not want to have to pay this. Representative Volmi, this is Chris. I, I think that's a question that's probably directed at Department of Health and Human Services. Well, so again, I'll, I'll reach out to Karen and let her know that that question may be coming. Yeah, we were, our committee was involved in, in redoing the MET tax when it was falling apart completely and nine years ago, and then a year or two later when this was created. Norm, can I just jump in real quick again? Um, go ahead, Pat. We have five more minutes. And yeah, I know. I'm two sorry. more topics. Go ahead, Pat. It's just, uh, I, I was involved in this 10 years, at nine, nine years ago, uh, where the CCRCs can continue in care uh, residential communities, which are uh, um, independent, assisted, and then nursing home 
but they, they, they life contracts, no Medicaid, and they wanted out of the Met tax. Uh, that was maybe that was the fight you were talking about, Susan. Yes. Uh, but there was no what happened that that bill got defeated. But short of it, that's the answer. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions on this? Because there's a few more items to cover in the next five minutes. Utility property tax. All right. Utility property tax. It's a tax rate of six point sixty cents per thousand of value. The tax is a value of utility property as determined by the department on December 1st of each year for the values as of April 1st. So when to file and pay on a reform May 1st of each year, the company files a form detailing the company's actual financial operating performance since the prior of April 1st of the preceding year. So final payments for this is are due January 15th. So essentially, there are estimate payments made on prior evaluations. So April, June, September, and December are on the, the prior evaluation. And then January 15th, we sort of call a true up return where they pay the difference from the prior year evaluation to the current rate. On the next slide, we have the UPT revenue 10 year trend. Uh, and some of the things that can affect the factors for UPT are obviously development of newer renewable energy facilities, valuation of utility property or energy pricing, supply and demand. Any, any questions on UPT? Questions or comments on the utility property tax? Uh, then we can go on to the railroad tax. So the railroad tax is a smaller tax compared to the ones we've previously discussed. Um, every railroad, railway, express, parlor, sleeping or dining car company operating for profit in New Hampshire pays a railroad tax. It's based on the market value of property's full and true value as of April 1st each year. Property values and average rates of taxation are determined by the DRA. On or before May 1st each year, the company files a form detailing the company's financial operating performance since April 1st of the preceding year. Payment is due within 30 days from the date of um, notice of value or tax bill, which is typically due December 15th. If those liabilities exceed $200, estimates equal to 25% of the tax are due on the 15th day of April, June, September, and December. To put this in perspective, um, for fiscal year 2020, $306,000 in tax revenue was collected with $91,689 being distributed to municipalities statewide. Any questions or comments on this, on the uh, railroad tax? Seeing none, go to the local property tax. All right, local property tax. It's split into two sections. We have the statewide education property tax, which is SWEP and the local property tax. For SWEP, the tax is assessed and collected by municipalities to be retained for use of their local school district. The tax is paid by everyone owning real property in the state. The department sets, as Lindsay had stated before, all the tax rates for the state and municipalities. So the department sets the tax rate of a level su sufficient to what's in the statute, which is 363 million. And then the rate is set to the nearest half cent necessary to generate that required revenue. And then for the local property tax side, uh, the property tax is based on, based on local assessed valuations and administered and collected by the individual towns and cities. Uh, the majority of the property taxes collected are based on the market value. And then there's some exemptions in the property taxes, which are listed below. Happy to answer any questions. I don't I, I'd, like, I'd like to just on um, ask her for something for later on. Um, I asked this last week, actually. Um, you have a major, major role in guarantee teeing the fairness of this tax across the towns. And it would be nice to have a sheet that showed your administration on that level. Sure, we can get you something that shows that. Okay, we can deal with that later as we meet with the DRA because we're running out of time. Uh, quick on the evacuation gravel tax. Yes, yeah, so the excavation or gravel tax is assessed at a rate of two cents per cubic yard of earth excavated with certain exceptions. It is assessed by and payable to local assessing officials. Um, the DRA is responsible for administering and enforcing the tax, which includes activities like educating municipal officials, 
checking volumes of excavated material, reporting violations to local and state officials, and entering any lands that may have been excavated at any point. A notice of intent to excavate along with a $100 admin fee must be filed with the DRA prior to excavation and at the beginning of each tax year, which is April 1st for those um, operations still in progress. Owners must report all earth excavated within 30 days of completion. Within 30 days of that date, local assessing officials must send a tax bill and then that tax must be paid within 30 days of it being mailed. Any questions for the gravel tax? I don't hear anybody who will go to the timber tax. So the timber tax is assessed at a rate of 10% of the stumpage value at the time of cutting. It is assessed by and payable to the local assessing officials, much like the gravel tax. The only exceptions are shade and ornamental trees, sugar orchards and nursery stock and Christmas trees and um, certain amounts of firewood. The DRA is responsible for administering and enforcing the tax, which also includes entering land, which there may be a timber operation reviewing those timber operation records and stopping any operations in violation, reporting those to local authorities. The owner must file a notice of intent to cut with municipal assessing officials with a copy to the owner, logger, and the DRA at the beginning of each tax year, April 1st, or for ongoing operations or prior to commencing each cutting operation. The owners, much like the excavation tax, must report all wood or timber cut within 30 days of completion. Local assessing officials assess the tax within 30 days, and then upon uh, mailing that bill, the tax must be paid within 30 days again. Any questions of the timber tax? Okay, uh, we'll go to the next item. Okay, so I think we've covered all our taxes. This is just a quick slide to have for your reference. It's just the timing of how DRA's money flows in. The top is by month, the middle is by quarter, and the the lower section is biannually. And I think the only thing to point out, which Lindsay had pointed out in the previous presentation, one of the big ones is IND. If you look at IND in the bottom half, the first half of the fiscal year only brings in 24% of the money and the second half brings in 76% of the money. So we have um, a big chunk of money coming in for the second half of the fiscal year. The next. And then, oh, and on the next slide, this is just a list of resources um, for, for your team and for the new people to look at. We have our annual report. We have our transparency page, which has some reporting. We have a daily revenue updates, which comes through email, which hopefully everybody on the committee is receiving at this point. We have our tax expenditure, which is on our web page. And then there's also a DRA listserv, which I highly recommend everybody subscribing to. And it essentially gives you alerts when press releases come out or TIR, TIRs are coming out sends you a notification uh, for those in, for those items. And do you want to briefly hit on the uh, non-laws? Hi, this is Carolyn. I'm going to take over for a minute. Um, so before we talk about revenues, it certainly makes sense to discuss the $30 million anom anomalous receivable. Um, as part of the state's year-end financial reporting, um, the state uh, converts revenue from a cash basis to an accrual basis. And in order to uh, determine accrual basis revenues, um, the state looks at the first 60 days of the fiscal year where the underlying activity had actually occurred in the prior, prior fiscal year um, and removes that from the current year and adds it back to the prior year. Um, these are amounts are referred to as the 60 day receivable um, and the process for determining the 60 day receivable happens in two phases, preliminary and final. Um, <clears throat> these amounts are typically fairly consistent from year to year. And um, as a result, we don't really talk about them. Um, but in this year, there was a difference. Um, first, the amounts for fiscal year 2020 for business taxes and the IND tax were more than usual due to the federal due date change. Um, the federal due date for personal and business income taxes was extended from April 15th to July 15th due to the pandemic. Um, here in New Hampshire, we only extended the due date to June 15th. Um, because we were mindful of ensuring revenues were received during the state's fiscal year as intended. However, many of our taxpayers still filed their New Hampshire state returns consistent with the federal July 15th due date. 
Um, and as a result, we had a lot of revenue received in, um, the, in this fiscal year rather than in last. Um, second, the amounts for the final day, the final 60 day receivable were more than the preliminary 60 day receivable um, as a result of incomplete revenue data for the month of July at the time those preliminary amounts were calculated. Um, these two factors resulted in the somewhat large $30.8 million in additional revenue received in July and August, um, which should have been attributable to fiscal year 2020. These amounts are um, listed on the monthly revenue focus and included in revenues received fiscal, fiscal year to date reported by us um, and are generally being accounted for when you take a look at our revenue estimate ranges as well. They're specifically called out. And there at the bottom, you'll see uh, the 30.8 million divided amongst the various taxes that we administer. Do you want to briefly uh, go through the revenue estimate summary? Uh, I guess I will take this. So um, what you see uh, in front of you is our fiscal year 21 revenue estimate summary. You'll see fiscal year 20 on the right, preliminary accrual plus the anomalous accrual. Moving to the right, you'll see plan for the year. You'll see our DRA low and high for each of the taxes of where we estimate that fiscal year 21 will land. And then we show you both the dollar amount and the percent percentage change from the DRA low to plan and then DRA high to plan. Uh, so again, this is just where we think fiscal year 21 is going to land because obviously this will serve as your base as you build your revenue estimates for fiscal years 22 and 23. I will call out at the bottom for Representative Abrami based on his comment last week. We're showing you the amounts of school building aid for fiscal year 21, what we anticipate the LCHIP amount to be, typically roughly 3%, and then the amount to the affordable housing fund, um, since the numbers up above are net of those. So you could add those back in before applying your growth rates. Okay, and a brief summary of the FY 22 and 23. Sure, for fiscal years 22 and 23, you'll see in the first column, we included the fiscal year 21 anomalous receivable. Um, you will want to take that out of fiscal year 21 before you apply growth rates for fiscal year 22 and 23. If you were to include it, you would essentially be double counting that revenue. Um, so we show you what the 21 anomalous receivable was, and then we remove it from our low and high estimates for fiscal year 21 in that second and third orange column. And then we give you growth ranges for fiscal years 22, a low and a high by tax type, and then fiscal years 23, a low and a high by tax type. Again, at the bottom, we'll give you the school building aid amounts. Um, which go into MNR, the L chip amount, which is part of RET, and the affordable housing fund transfer, which is also part of RET. Again, so that you can add those back in prior to applying your growth rates if that's how you would like to estimate your revenues. We'll obviously be prepared to come back whenever the committee is ready to dive into this in more detail, but we wanted to, or we were asked and we wanted to provide you with our preliminary thoughts for fiscal years 21, 22, and 23. And a few brief words on your RIMS system. Sure. So RIMS, our revenue information management system is a 30.1, 30.2, almost million dollar um, capital project that the DRA is currently undertaking. The goal here is to replace our current TIMS system, um, which was implemented in 1990. That system is obsolete and limited in its functionality. Uh, RIMS will be used internally here at the department, but it also has a public facing portal, which I'll show you in just a second for taxpayers and practitioners. Um, we are doing this in conjunction with DOIT. We have a great partnership with the Department of Information Technology, and we are working with a vendor called Fast Enterprises um, for them to implement their commercial off the shelf software product GenTax, which is in many other states across the United States. Implementation is going to be in three phases, each taking about a year, and the total contract with FAST is just under $30 million. 
This is an outline of the three phases. Um, we have already completed rollout one, which went live on October 28th of 2019, which included the meals and rentals tax, Medicaid enhancement tax, and nursing facility quality assessment. In October, we went live with our second rollout, our largest rollout uh, really for the business profits tax, business enterprise tax, interest and dividends tax, and communication services tax. That is on time. Um, even working through the pandemic and trans transitioning to remote work, we were able to keep that go live date. So we're really proud of the work that was done there. And then currently we are in the middle of rollout three, which will go live at the beginning of August. And that includes all of our other miscellaneous taxes, tobacco, RET, UPT, railroad, timber, gravel, et cetera. And again, we are on track to complete that go live on time as well. Lastly, this is just um, a screenshot of Granite Tax Connect. If you were to uh, go to DRA's website and, and attempt to log into GTC, this is what you would see. Um, a few things I would note here, um, you can make a payment right from this home screen. You can apply for an application. If you're opening a new restaurant, for instance, you can do that right from here. Um, you can register with us to begin filing and paying your taxes. Um, you can also request a certificate, such as a certificate of good standing, and you can report tax fraud to us right from the home page as well. Um, this increased functionality has really been wonderful for both the DRA and for taxpayers. Historically, if you wanted to know um, what your estimate payment was last quarter, um, if you couldn't remember, you would have to call into our call center. And while those folks are wonderful, um, you'd have to call and talk to someone in order to get that information. Now, if you register through GTC, you can access your account at any time. You can see your payments, you can make a payment, you can file a return and perform another, a number of other functions. So this has really catapulted DRA into the 21st century in terms of providing functionality and account access to our taxpayers. Okay. I want to thank Lindsay, Carolyn, Melissa, and Devin for great presentations this morning and all the on all the DRA tax activities going on, explaining the history and where we are. And we'll be getting them back as we do revenue estimates. And we thank you. And we need to go on to our next presenter. Thank, thank you, everybody. You for a great presentation. Brad? Brad? Yes. And who is the next person up on your list? I okay. just met Charlie McIntyre. We are about 10 minutes behind. And the next is Charlie McIntyre, the direct executive director of the Lottery Commission. And he's going to talk about the lottery. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. This is Charlie McIntyre, um, director of the National Lottery. With me in my office is our Chief Financial Officer, Jim Duras. I had forwarded um, a presentation a couple of three days ago to the committee. Should I share the screen I have or should is it gonna be shared through um, Chris Shea? Brad, you can share your screen if you would like. I could try that, I'm not particularly good at it. I'll try. Do you see it? We're already doing it. Yes. Oh, yes. Hey, what do you know? I went to law school. So um, obviously mine will be very brief compared to uh, my colleague, Ms. Step from DRA. Um, the lottery is comprised of a number of revenue sources broken down um, as follows. Um, and after each revenue source is an estimate of the revenue we expect to derive this year from that source. And in cases where we've raised guidance, there'll be brackets and the amount we expect to increase over what we had originally estimated based on various factors we can get into. So the first source is our jackpot games, which are Powerball, Mega Millions and Megabucks. Uh, as many of you know, these are highly visible games, very profitable. Um, we had just had a giant jackpot run for Powerball Mega Millions, which to give you an example, in one week we would do 6 million in sales in Powerball and Mega Millions, where an average week would be 700,000. So it's a, you know, a nine, sometimes 10X factor growth. So 
for the for the fiscal year 21, we expect to conservatively do $21.5 million profit in those three product lines. Following next is Tri-State Games. Uh, Megabucks is a Tri-State game, but we also sell a, a number of other ones. Uh, pick three, pick four, which are daily number of games. Uh, Gimme five, which is a pick five number of game and fast play, which is a terminal product. We share all of those with Vermont and Maine. They're all very stable, very dependable, very normalized. Uh, we expect $9.7 million in profit with those. Kino is a game uh, you folks approved in 2018. Uh, we launched in 2018, which was the fastest launch of Kino in the US history. Uh, and that had been enjoying tremendous growth pre-COVID uh, when bars closed down, as you can imagine, uh, sales plummeted. Sales have rebounded nicely um, and are accelerating. So we estimate another quarter of million dollars profit over and above our revenue estimates of November. Uh, so $7.75 million for Kino this fiscal year. Uh, Lucky for Life is a multi-state game we share with a number of states. Um, the top prize never changes, so the sales are very stable. $1.6 million profit there. Insta tickets is the bulk of what we sell. Um, they're sold at retail. They're throughout our 1200 retail network. Uh, have been available for many, many years. The stable in almost every lottery in the U.S. Um, and the sales have been increasing. So we're raising guidance a million dollars to $53 million for scratch ticket sales and profitability. Next would be mobile and internet, which you folks approved in 2018. It has been the fastest growing area of the lottery. Um, it, it, you can buy Powerball Mega Millions and you can buy scratch tickets through your mobile applications. And we had estimated $10 million profit in November. We now estimate $13 million profit uh, for this fiscal year. Sports betting, which is our newest product line, uh, launched in 2019, uh, December 30th. Um, this fiscal year sales of that have been, have been higher than we anticipated, um, but we're still nervous as you can imagine we're unclear as to the sports betting map or the sports betting calendar, as it were, uh, obviously with COVID, but given the acceleration and the growth we've enjoyed, um, by way of example, we had a record December um, in terms of sports betting activity. We estimate $11 million profit for sports betting for this fiscal year. And finally uh, is charitable gambling, which involves all of the charitable functions of the state uh, bingo, Lucky Seven, and includes also some small version of horse racing, uh, simulcast. Um, that function is really regulatory. We don't really get involved in promotion. Um, that is, generates about $3 million. So that all being said, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, the lottery is raising guidance, uh, $10 million to this fiscal year of $120.55 million for revenue for this fiscal year. Um, well and above what we had originally estimated. And I'll stop there and answer any questions you want to have if that works for you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, it does. Uh, let me pull up. And, uh, Representative Major, uh, panelists should be able to raise their hand, hands now if people want to go ahead and try that. Great. Okay, questions. Raise your panel. Representative Bromney first. Representative Bromley, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, Charlie, it's Pat. Um, uh, for the Powerball and Mega Millions, can you tell the committee how much we make per ticket sold, or how that works? Certainly. Um, Powerball and Mega Millions are our most profitable games. Out of every dollar sold, 40.5 cents approximately is profit, and that goes directly to the state. So. It's, I want to say our most erratic product because some years, like I said, some weeks, the jackpot's a billion dollars and some weeks, the jackpot's 20. And the growth and sales is exponential in those high jackpot weeks. So our sales depend on having a number of large jackpots in a given year. And our revenues reflect the number of jackpots we have in a given year. Because like I said, it is our most profitable product. Um, 40.5 cents, give or take, uh, every dollar we sell. Thank you. Hey, Representative uh, Amanda Grove. 
Um, thank you. I just had one question. While you're going through the revenue sources, um, for example, you would say like the jackpot games, 21.5 million was profit or is that just revenue? It's profit. Every number on your screen okay. representative, uh, give the question. That's our what we expect to profit. And obviously these are estimates Thank because you. our expenses vary by profit, by product. Um, but you know, and obviously we don't account for every staff member's time as against each product, you know, like with like a billing sheet, but these are all profit numbers. Thank you. Uh, Representative Almy. Representative, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> uh, quick, just quickly on, for instance, jackpot games, the first one. 21.5 is what you have raised the, your projection to, and 2.4 is the amount you raised it. Correct. Yes, Representative. Yes. Thank you. Uh, further questions or comments? Uh, Representative Elliott. You'll have to unmute yourself, Representative Elliott. Okay, um, Charles, I uh, wondered how do you account for this the success? Is it because of the, the, the corona effect? People are being staying home more often and they're bored and they need a little excitement in their life. How do you account for your success? <laughs> I mean, certainly, um, I like to think we did had something to do with it, Representative. Um, you know, we're certainly, if you look to our neighbors, our growth rate is far and away faster than anybody else around us. So I certainly, you, you credit a lot of the folks here. I do think there have been a number of additional citizens of the state who would not be here ordinarily, but have accounted for sales. Like, for example, instant tickets sales have increased, but not across the state uniformly. It's been really pockets of growth. And so like along the Lakes region, you've seen a significant growth of sales. I think a lot of folks have moved up here during COVID that wouldn't be ordinarily. And that's accounting for some of our sales growth as well. And I also think there's a lot of entertainment options that don't exist anymore. And folks are looking for something to do that's, you know, that's entertaining. So to your point, yes, part COVID, part, we're, we're pretty good at what we do. Thank you. Charlie, relative to the sports betting, with the pandemic going on now, it doesn't seem like that affected it. No, no, we had a real bad dip in March through June when there was virtually nothing to bet on. All sports had canceled. Um, but there's been an exuberance essentially of um, just happy sports are back. And I think that's accounted for a lot of it. We also derive a tremendous amount of activity from Massachusetts at our facilities in Manchester and Seabrook. Um, I would estimate 75, 80% of our revenue at Seabrook is from Massachusetts in terms of sports betting activity. So I think I can't, I personally underestimated how much interest there was um, in that. We also, even on the mobile side, Representative Major, 20, plus percent of our revenues come from Massachusetts, folks driving across the border to place a bet at, you know, the mall in Nashua or the traffic circle in Portsmouth. They stop in the liquor store in the parking lot, place a bet, and then drive back to Mass or Maine. So we've seen a lot of that as well, more so than I anticipated. Okay, I don't see any other hand, so why don't you continue? Okay, certainly. So this is just a general overview um, of the lottery sales by game over the last 10 years. And as you can see, the bulk of it has been scratch tickets. It's far and away the most, in terms of gross dollars. These are, this is a graph by gross sales. Uh, most of what we sell is scratch tickets. Um, and really it's, so really now our sales would be in order of size would be scratch tickets and then Kino followed by Powerball and then Mega Millions. Um, Sports betting is obviously a big number in terms of how much betting activity we do, but it's a very low margin activity. Uh, sports betting for the state really is, well, profits around 7%, and we split that with DraftKings 50-50. And here is sort of the lottery in a nutshell. 
I wanted you to have this number because it is, it's uh, page four on this uh, presentation, but it's in our comprehensive annual financial report, which rolls up into the state uh, financial report. And here are all the numbers in a nutshell. Um, as you can see, we've enjoyed uh, tremendous growth over the last 10 years. And obviously this year, now that we're estimating $120 million, um, we have a very like, very possible chance to essentially double our net revenues over the last 10 years, which we're obviously very proud of. Um, and in some cases you can see like scratch tickets, as you go across that line, tremendous growth. You know, from $161 million in 2011 to last year was $272 million. And this year I can tell you we'll, we'll exceed 300 million. Um, but contrast that with say, for example, the Powerball and Mega Millions line, where in 2019, those combined for 60, you know, 69 million. And last year they combined for 41 million. So like I said, they're quite erratic and that's based on jackpot sizes. And so when we revenue estimate, scratch tickets, you know, we can tell you within hundred dollars, give or take, what the profit will be for a year. Powerball Mega Millions, it varies wildly by year. So, um, I'll leave this, uh, so obviously our trends would be, uh, we expect growth continued on our digital platforms, both internet lottery and sports betting. Um, the biggest impact to our sales, generally speaking, particularly at retail is fuel prices. Um, we do 52% of our sales at retail at places that sell gas too. So um, gas prices have a direct impact on our sales more so than essentially any other function. And then if Massachusetts passes sports betting, we would expect a dramatic impact on our revenues. So those are our trends, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'll put that slide back up because it obviously contains the most data and your membership may have the most questions regarding anything on that sheet, if that's okay with you. That's fine. Questions from the committee. Representative Tucker. Yes. Um could you talk about problem gambling a little bit? I hadn't realized how enormous the lottery sales were. Is that something that people become habituated to, addicted to in the same way as we worry about other forms of gaming? Certainly, no, there's no question. If you look at any of the research that we follow and we do, um, one to one and a half percent of the people who play, who gamble, are technically problem gamblers. And in a state like New Hampshire, uh, you know, that's thousands of people. So there is an issue obviously with problem gambling. Um, there is a council that was set up uh, by you folks a couple of years back, which is staff, uh, which is um, appointed folks uh, by the governor approved by the executive council set up to address it. They're in the process now of an RFP um, to contract for services, um, but we are candidly behind some other states in terms of our addressing the issue. Could I ask a follow-up, please? A follow-up. The reason I'm asking is there's some other uh, gaming opportunities or uh, bills that are coming forward. And so it would be probably a good idea to have a good handle on how the RS, how the uh, requests for proposals are coming along and what kind of timeline uh, we're talking about to deal with problem gamblers, because I think that will be one of the first questions people will want to know the answers to. Okay, certainly I can, I can arrange for that as it comes up, Representative Tucker. Thank you. Uh, further questions from the committee? Hey, you did a great job, Charlie. I tried to be fast, I knew you guys were behind. <laughs> All right. As a matter of fact, you. We're right on schedule now. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Good to see you, Representative, um, everybody. Mr. Chairman, thank you. All right. You keep up the good work. <laughs> All right. We're right on schedule. So 1130. The next is the Liquor Commissioner, Joseph Malika, who is Chairman of the Liquor Commission, and Tina Demers, the Chief Financial Officer. 
and they close. That time now. Do you want to share your screen? I'm allowing Tina to talk. I don't know if one of the, the phone numbers is uh, Commissioner Malika. We're in the same room. We're in the same room. Okay. So I'll make you a panelist then. Thank you. I don't seem to have the option of sharing my screen. Should. Uh, Brad, do you know why? I has promoted them to a panelist. So they should be able to do that oh, now. I, I did too. Maybe we crossed paths there. Maybe we'll get this technology now. There we go. Can they make that screen bigger? One slide at a time. Right. Can can you make the slide bigger? Brad, can you help them out? Uh, yes. If they go to I mean, the display settings, maybe. Go to the display settings, you may be able to make it full screen. You may need to deselect the magnifying glass as well. It's pretty Sorry. Weird. Hold on. I put it on the slideshow presentation. Does that come up on full screen? No, there's two screens. Two screens. It's still bigger than it was. Hold on, let me try one other thing. Let me just... Oops, no. Same thing. Yeah. Yes. You select display settings. Is there an option to make it full screen? Up at the top, you have a display setting. Maybe you can click that. This. There you go. There we go. That's better. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So we're ready to go if you are, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Take it away. Okay, members of the committee. Good morning. For the record, I'm Joseph Mollica, Chairman of the New Hampshire Liquor Commission, and with us is our CFO, Tina Demuse. You'll see on slide two, the statutory responsibility that guides our everyday work here at the Liquor Commission, RSA 176-3. And on slide three, Tina will take you through our revenue history, and then I'll get back to speaking with you. Thank you very much. All right. To start out, we wanted to start out showing the net profit history of the commission. And then with each slide, we're gonna break down to what makes up our profit numbers and our transfers. The first chart shows the net profit growth since the commission started in 1935. In the commission's 85 years of operation, it's earned over 4 billion in net profit. The other chart is just the last six years of actual net profit from FY14 at 148.7 million to 154.6 million in FY20. And year to date for FY21, we're at 89.3 million, 
of which we've transferred 75.3 million to the general fund and 14 million to the granted advantage um, to HHS, which I'll explain further on in the slides. This next slide is our revenue broken down into our three main categories. We have beer tax and permits, which is a 30 cents tax on a gallon, per gallon sold or transferred from retail or to the public from authorized licensees. Liquor and wine revenue is the sale of wine spirits and accessories through our outlet stores and warehouses to retail customers, such as on-premise licensees, which are restaurants and lounges, and off-premise licensees, the grocery stores and markets. The, the last category is other revenue, which is primarily our licensee fees, but it also includes direct shipping permits, lottery, and other miscellaneous revenue. This next slide is the FY 16 to 20 annual um, actual with FY um, 21 to 23 projections. The annual growth from 16 to 20 was less than 1% or around 1.2 million annually. FY 20 had a high revenue growth from pandemic purchases. It was a 2.2% growth or $5 million increase you'll see an even more significant increase projected for FY21, which is about 4.6% or 10.3 million. And this is primarily a result of not running uh, the promotional card programs that we've done in prior years, which was the spend 150 and receive a $25 gift card. Last year, we ran it in July, November, and March. Um, the last one was done in March of 2020. And this actually equated to a $10 million increase in our gross profit in, uh, projected in FY21. FY22 and 23 projections, the growth rate is slightly higher than the prior year normal growth rate at 1.3 and 1.5%, which equates to about three and $3.5 million annual increase. On slide six, this, is the, um, this provides revenue and expense history that makes up our net profit, which you can see at the top of each bar. Um, FY21 to FY23 projections are all around $160 million. This is because um, from an expense side where we also have growth, um, primarily in FY21, the increase is for salaries and benefits of $2 million and IT and debt, which is increasing about a million dollars. FY22 and 23 projections, uh, we not only have our normal operating expense growth, but we also have additional expenses associated with our new POS system and POS and back office system. And we also have an additional paycheck in FY23, which is around $1.6 million. On slide seven, this just shows the total net profit broken down by liquor and wine and beer, which are the two transfer categories that we have. Okay, and on slide eight, and in conjunction with it, slide nine, if you, could, you can look at both of them together. Um, this slide is important because it shows the history of the transfer to health and human services for, the, for first the alcohol abuse Prevention and Treatment Fund, and then the Granted Advantage Healthcare Trust Fund, the transfer to um, HHS. So you can see in FY16, we had to transfer 3.2 million, and that was at a 1.7% of our prior year gross profit. And each year that percentage has changed to the point in FY20, it was uh, 5%, which equated to $10 million. In FY21, we not only have the 5% transfer of $10 million, but there is another statute, which is um, the RSA 126AA colon three, where HHS can request uh, additional funds if the granted advantage fund is running short. So this year they're requesting an additional $8.5 million be transferred for a total of $18.5 million being transferred to HHS, which is less um, that's being transferred to the general fund. And you can see that whole breakdown 
on um, slide nine. So in FY21, we're projecting to transfer 129 million to the general fund um, for liquor and wine. 13.2 million for the beer transfer, and then we're transferring the 18.5 million to HHS. The FY 22 and 23 projections only include the 5%, so about the $10 million, because we, um, we might have um, Health and Human Services asking within each of those fiscal years for additional funds, but for now we have to only put in what's currently in law, which is the 5%. So if we go to slide 10, we wanted to provide um, a breakdown of our sales. You have for FY16. Do you want to show, you I want to show slide 10? Slide nine. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was flipping my page and I didn't flip. Okay, so I'll go back. This is the slide that shows the breakdown for the transfers. So you can see the transfer, like for FY23, the transfer of 136.3 million um, to the general fund with 13.2 for beer tax and then the 10.9 for HHS. I'm sorry, I got to turn the page. <laughs> and that 10.9 is just an estimated number. Right, 5% of the prior year yeah. gross profit. You can see in FY21, the estimated number and the additional number that they've asked for on the previous slide, making up the 18 million. 18.5. 18.5. Okay. So the next two slides, we just wanted to provide um, some of our sales breakdown. So on this slide, you can see FY 16 to 20, our retail and on-premise sales um, for FY 20 were higher than normal and on-premise was down due to the pandemic. Um, FY20 retail was 158.9 million, up 46.5 million or 8.7%. Off-premise was 114 million, up 5.5 million or 5%. And on-premise was 62.2 million, down 15.5 million or 19%. We go to, excuse me, slide 11. This um, slide shows the breakdown by spirits and wine category by our, re by our customer types. So spirit sales are 60% of our business at 454.4 million in FY20. Retail is 90% of that at 410 million. On-premise is 9%, 42.1 million, and off-premise is 1% or 2.3 million. On the wine side, they make up 40% of our business at 303.7 million. Retail is 56 or 172 million. And off-premise is 37% or 112 million. And on-premise is 7% or 20 million. And at this point, I will hand it back over to the chairman. And just a, just a note for, for the committee is that we've seen our, our off our off, I'm sorry, our on-premise partners vary between 40% off to about 25% off. So their sales have suffered tremendously. As we all know, the restaurants are struggling during this pandemic. So we've seen them off at as much as 45, 46%. And right at this point, they're off still by about 25%. So on slide 12, our outlet locations, we have 69 outlets, 60 are leased. It's approximately 520,000 square feet. We have nine state-owned outlets that are listed. They're approximately 142,000 square feet. And the state-owned outlets account for about 160 million or 26% of our total sales. And you'll see the map on the left. Our outlet locations with curbside that we've just launched in March. So you can get onto our website, order your product, and then uh, pay for it after pay for it electronically and pick it up at the store. We started with two stores in May of 2020. We're now up to 10 stores. This week, as of yesterday, we just launched uh, two more stores in Bedford and Tilton. 
And on February 8th, we'll launch two more stores in Keene and Epsom. Those stores are presently at just under 1.5 million in curbside sales. On page 14, you'll see the top 15 locations across the state. And the ones with the asterisk are the state owned locations that are in the top 15 stores. So the top 15 stores account for 51% of our sales and all other stores account for 49% of our sales. You'll see on page six, I'm sorry, on page 15, the new outlet at the Portsmouth Traffic Circle, year-to-date sales are 19.4 million and you'll notice the sales increase in that new location is up 14.1%. On page 16, a new lo outlet location in Lancaster, which was a combination consolidation of a store in West Umberland and in Lancaster. Sales are 1.6 million, they're up 47.2%. On 17, our new store in Dover, Summersworth Line, that was a consolidation of two stores, the old Dover and Summersworth stores. Year-to-date sales are 7.7 .7 million, and that's an increase of 19.1%. Our new outlet in West Lebanon on page 18, sales year-to-date are 10.5 million. That was just a transfer to a new store, new location, sales increase of 22.4%. And our new outlet in Tilton, which was a consolidation of our stores in Belmont and Franklin, Year-to-date, 4.3 million in sales, an increase of 16%. So you can see, clearly see through the numbers that our consolidation and branding efforts are working tremendously. On page 20, these are the upcoming outlet locations. They're listed on the left. Epson was open last Friday, and we just signed a deal in Claremont that will open in 2020. 2022 in the spring. So those are the new locations that will be coming online uh, with our branding in place. On page 21, we have the outlets that we closed this year. These were older, underperforming outlets that no longer fit our brand model of excellent shopping experience, a large amount of SKUs, and people are just a great shopping experience that I'm sure that everyone's experienced as they've been in our new outlets. These outlets, unfortunately, didn't cut, didn't cut the mustard, so they're no longer with us. On page 22, you'll see some new initiatives in our new website that'll be launched, uh, or that was launched in September of 2020. You can go on, there's bottle shots, you can walk through our whole inventory, you can order the product on the website. You can have it delivered curbside to your car and direct shipping, which is part of SB 14 on the initiatives on the bottom will be launched in the fall. And then you'll be able to order the product and have it delivered right to your door in state to start with. And then in the 13 states around the nation that allow us to direct ship into their homes. So that's our initiatives moving forward into 2021 and 2022. And we would be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have of us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Almey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was wondering how long it takes to pay off the bonding from the new stores and provide a net gain in the transferred profits? The, most of the new stores that we've done have been a partnership with the landlord. So we amortize um, the fit up costs into our rent and that gets paid off with additional square footage over a 10 year period. The only stores that we've done that we own is the Portsmouth store and the Hampton stores that will be coming up. So no longer do we, do we ask for appropriation to build these stores. We partner with our business partners, our landlord. We add about between $2.20 and 
to $2.68 a square foot on the first 10 years of our 20 year lease, then that, that cost is paid off. A lot of the times our rent goes down and we continue for our 20 year lease. So there's no output of cash from the state or the liquor commission to build these stores. It's all done on a square foot percentage basis that's added into the cost of our lease for the first 10 years. Representative Tucker. Representative Tucker, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, could you tell me how you are managing to do so well against the Massachusetts stores? A couple of years ago, you talked about how Massachusetts has changed its viewpoint towards liquor and had become much more competitive. And how is that working for New Hampshire and Massachusetts together? Well, uh, it's, it's not working together, Representative, uh, quite frankly. Uh, we are in competition with them. Uh, when Governor uh, Patrick was in, he changed the liquor license, owning liquor licenses in uh, Massachusetts from three licenses up to 10 in 2020. So that, that brought in total wine and spirits. The furthest north they had been at that point was Connecticut. They have six stores in Mass Massachusetts now. They have 213 stores nationwide and they do over $3 billion in sales a year. But they are a private label uh, retailer. So they, they come up with their own labels, their own wines, and they put them in their stores. They do carry nationally advertised brands like the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets do, but they're not nearly as competitive in pricing as, as we have been able to be. When they first came into the market, they were, they were running a lot of lost leaders, which was driving some of our traffic cross border but you can only do that for a period of time. There was a number of lawsuits in Massachusetts against them. Some, some they prevailed, some they didn't, but they were selling product below cost, which they can no longer do. Uh, obviously our branding initiative started 10 years ago. So we were ahead of them being in Massachusetts. Uh, our brand is recognized, our value is recognized. And we still, we still, as a retailer, recognize that over 50% of our business comes from cross-border and about 23% of that is from Massachusetts. So we clearly market to that, uh, to, to those individuals in Massachusetts, and we welcome them coming here. Thank you. My Representative uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm not too sure if the commissioner is prepared for this question, but I'm just reflecting back to what was just asked of lottery. And uh, first of all, thank you for the great job that, that the Liquor Commission is doing. But I'm curious if you track in any way problem drinking and, and if you could maybe uh, give us a little background on that, if that is the case. Well, all of that is tracked and any information that we get is, is tracked through our enforcement division. And I'd be happy to share the information that we have that's public information with the committee, but it's not something that I have in front of me here at this moment. Thank you so much. So you can share that with us the next time we meet, which won't be too, well, too far from now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, any further questions of the liquor commission? Uh, you did a great job and, and keep the growth going. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. We appreciate that. We have a great team here and everyone works together and we recognize uh, how important we are to the state as a revenue source. And we take that, uh, that charge very seriously. So thank you. Well, thank you. And for the committee, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a break and come back at one o'clock to listen to the judicial branch followed by the Department of Health and Human Services 
and Securities and the Department of Justice. And uh, Brad, we recommend that they don't leave the system, but... Um, yeah, I would recommend that people just uh, mute themselves and um, turn their cameras off. And I will put up a... I will share my screen right now saying that we're on a lunch break till one. And I will... Um, and then uh, Representative uh, Bromney has a has his hand up. Yeah, uh, Representative Loffman, you there? Representative Loffman? Yes, I am. Yeah, but you weren't on when we first started. We, we, we took a, we asked a question when everybody signed on. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you gonna be remote or in person on Thursday? Remote. Okay, thank you. And is Representative Nunez, I don't think you're there. I, I'm here, sir. I joined just a little while ago. I was presenting a bill in another committee. I'm sorry I'm late. Are you gonna Are you gonna be in person on Thursday or remote? I should be in person, sir. Okay, thank you. We're all set, Norm. Okay, so everybody have a great lunch. Make sure that you uh, mute your video and mute your. I do have my hand up, um, Representative. Oh, Representative Southwood, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. I do have to do some other things with my computer. Should I just use the Zoom invitation again when I'm done? I would think so, uh, Brad. That is correct. It's, the Zoom link should still work. Okay, great. I'll do that. Thank you. All right, then we'll see you, everybody back at one o'clock. Thank you.
Hey, Brad, we'll give another minute for people to come on board. Okay. Brad? This is Jenny Gamarlo, Brad. Yes, Representative Gamarlo. I accidentally shut my computer and had to log back in. Can you make me the co-host again, please? I'll do that right now. Thank you. <laughs> we don't want to lose you. <laughs> she's she's a techie. Yeah, I, I ruined your raise hand function this morning. That's how techy I am. Oh. No, I didn't do it. I don't know what happened. But... <laughs> Yeah, I'm not entirely sure why that happened, but I guess there was a setting that this needed to be checked. Um, that you know, it's a very polite committee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were really out of order, weren't we? <laughs> I mean, not exactly storming the Capitol. <laughs> hey, Norm, Pat. Norm. Hey, Pat, you're going to have to raise your volume. Uh, give it, here we go again. Well, can I'll, hardly hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll talk up for now. Um, just so you have the total eight eight going to be in person on Thursday and um, and uh, sixteen remote. Pat, you're going to have to raise your volume. Maybe Brad can help you on that. So. And you should be able to do that if you go to your microphone at the bottom of the screen and select the carrot the little arrow and then select audio settings. You should be able to um, increase the volume on your speakers. Okay, we have had this before when. Tell me when you're ready, Pat. Well, I'm having trouble finding the audio settings. Um, so on my computer- Norm, he said eight in person and 16 uh, not yep. virtual. So try these up yeah. here, Pat. Right. Right. Up in this section of your keyboard. On the top there? Yes, they, because it looks like a little megaphone. And one of them shuts it off, one of them turns it down, and the other one turns it up. Well, they're, they're all different. Yeah, they are. They're all slightly different. But um, just, just, brought me. What kind of a device are you on? I'm on a Dell laptop. OK, so if you um, move your pointer to the bottom of, your, of the screen, yeah. Do you see the microphone at the bottom left hand corner? Yep. Right. If you select the carrot next to it, the little um, triangle next to it, you should see an option for audio settings. Do you know what? A... Well, I don't have an arrow. I don't have a. I don't have a. There's no arrow up to the right of it. A tiny one, just a little one like that. No, I just clicked on it. I got microphone. I mean, a screen popped up. All right. So if you click on that. If you click on the little, on the arrow and you select audio settings, if, if there is an option for that. No, I didn't do it that way. I just clicked on the microphone and I got a screen oh. popped up. He wants you to click on the little arrow. It's a stylized arrow. No, I don't have that online. You have to go to audio setting. If you got your, uh, if you got the mic screen up, you can see a on the, the second paragraph down, it says microphone. You can move your volume up there. I think that's the screen you're looking at. This is microphone uh, apps on. She's a Microsoft store app. No, it's a. Mm. No. And you're not seeing the arrow next to the um, button for the microphone that says mute. Should be in the Zoom call itself. Zoom call itself. Yeah. Within the screen, I think. If you're on the Zoom screen, um, you should see oh, a. Zoom, oh, the Zoom screen. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, you got it. What? I didn't do anything. <laughs> well, my computer made a noise. So if you go into the Zoom screen. I'm uh, on the Zoom screen and I got the bar on the bottom. All right. Do you see a microphone on the left on the left side? Way oh, over on the left. Oh, near the near the uh, okay, yeah, no, I got it. Yep. If there's a little arrow next to it, if you click on that, you select audio settings. See, it's a stylized arrow. Yes. Well, I have the mute button with the microphone, and I thought there's a little arrow going up on that. I That's it. That. Click yes, on that. you want the arrow to the right. Just to the right, between stop video and mute. Yeah, I, I clicked on that. Let yep. Brad give him the instructions. And then I got, that uh, says, select a microphone. That's click. Select a speaker. Yep. All the way to the bottom. If oh, there's audio if, settings, bottom, bingo, yep. If there's a section on the microphone yep. setting uh, for volume, pretty, it's turn pretty, that up. Well, it's pretty, oh, wait a minute. You have to be in audio settings. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Norm, we lost your video. Oh, I have it, I have it up to the top. I have oh. it up to the maximum. There, there we go. Am, okay. Input level, Thanks. volume. I have yep. it set to the, the maximum. We can hear okay, you. I think we need to go there. Yeah, I know, yeah, this is time to move on. You can continue working on that. Okay, we need to get started. Um, since we're still connected, we're going to be hearing from the judicial branch. Christopher Keating is the director of the administrative office of the courts, and he'll be joined with Donna Raymond, the budget director. So Christopher, it's yours. Christopher Raymond there? Yeah, they were, yes. Thanks, Representative Major. They were just letting me in. Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you. That's great. Um, Your audio is good. So I'm uh, grateful to be joined by Donna Raymond, our fiscal manager. She's the brains of the operation. Uh, so she's gonna manage our presentation. All right. The show is yours. <clears throat> I noticed Donna Raymond is is muted on both the audio and the uh, video. Is that she's better? Sharing her screen right now. Is that correct? I'm sharing my screen. Can you see our presentation? Yes. 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 And you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon. Again, I apologize. Um, but thank you. Um, I am the fiscal manager for the judicial branch and also with us today is Chris Keating, the director of the administrative office of the courts. We are not in the same room together. Um, we are both working remotely, I believe. Uh, thank you again for an opportunity to discuss our, um, our revenues that are unrestricted. Uh, we certainly don't have the revenue volumes that um, some of our other agencies have. I was listening to liquor's presentation and lotteries, but you know, I'd like to think every penny counts. We're more around the $13 million range each year. But I thought I would start by just providing an overview of the different types of uh, unrestricted revenues that the courts collect. And if certainly if you have any questions, um, chime in. And then we would just discuss um, the past five year history of those revenues and what factors we think will influence um, our projections for the upcoming biennium. So the judicial branch uh, consists of Supreme, Superior, and Circuit Courts. And we collect revenues through um, a number of different means, but primarily fines as well as entry fees to file motions, requests, and other things. 
We also have a fairly significant portion of unrestricted revenue, revenues that we call other that are primarily records research fees. So in terms of the fines that we collect, it's primarily motor vehicle and criminal fines. Both we and the Department of Safety collect motor vehicle fines. Uh, if you get a plea by mail motor vehicle fine, you have the option to just pay the fine directly to the Department of Safety, in which case that revenue shows up on their book. But if you choose to contest your fine or if the fine is such that you cannot pay it via plea by mail, you then will get um, a court date and then you can state your case. And if you are found guilty, then the courts will collect that, that revenue. We also impose criminal fines. And those fines can be collected directly at the courts, or if the court has so ordered, the fine um, will be collected by the Department of Corrections via one of their field offices. When that takes place, I believe the process is every two weeks, um, an electronic file is sent over to the courts indicating the case and the amount of money that, were, that was collected on that case. And then our court staff manually enter that information on our books. So the revenue is actually reported on our books, but it is collected by Department of Corrections. In terms of fines, there are penalty assessments that are levied on many of our fines uh, for criminal offenses, motor vehicle, um, as well as violations of municipal ordinances. And penalty assessment is $2.24% of the fine. I don't know that we've ever had a fine that would get you a $2 penalty assessment. <laughs> Usually your fine is in the $100 or up range. So on a $100 fine, the penalty assessment would be $24. The total fee you would pay is $124. Of that, the $100 is the fine portion, goes to the general fund. The penalty assessment portion of it splits. So currently, um, 66 or two thirds percent of the penalty assessment is deposited to the general fund, and that is as of fiscal year 2017. Uh, it used to be that that portion of the penalty assessment went to police standards and training, but with the declining revenue in general of penalty assessment, it was becoming difficult for um, police standards and training to have enough revenue to support its operations. As a result, they are now, I believe, 100% generally funded, so we send that revenue now to the general fund to help offset what the general fund uh, provides to police standards and training for them to operate. The other two thirds um, is split evenly. So one, excuse me, the other one third. So um, half of that goes to the judicial branches IT dedicated fund. And the other half of it goes to Department of Justice's Victims Assistance Fund. And just as an aside, um, the IT dedicated fund um, has recently as well had its share of issues in terms of having adequate revenues to support its operations. And that has been documented in the last few annual IT dedicated fund reports that we have filed with the legislature. Um, the, so we had proposed a few different solutions to that. Ultimately, it was decided that general funds would augment the shortfall. So that has happened in this last biennium and we are proposing the same solution in this biennium. So in terms of um, collection effectiveness, so we are not a collection agency. However, we do have issues with people not paying their fines. So we have a few mechanisms that we employ to try to get people to pay what they are owed to the state. Um, so individuals who pay, fail to pay court ordered motor vehicle fines are defaulted. So their license is suspended. So Department of Safety will send a warning notice to the individual. If they continue to not pay, then their driver's license and registration are suspended. We also have reciprocity in a lot of states. So if they're actually not from this state and they still get the fine, we can suspend their license in the state in which they hold their license. And if they are defaulted, there is a $50 administration fee that needs to be paid um, to, to clear that default. In terms of other types of collection effectiveness, um, we do also issue arrest orders um, for unpaid fines in misdemeanor and felony case cases. There is a, um, a re electronic repository of that information that a police officer can look up uh, and act on it if he becomes aware of it. 
and then we also try to discourage time payments. Again, you're taking your fine, you're splitting it up into smaller pieces. We try to discourage that. Um, and in so doing, we hopefully lower the uncollected fine balance and we shorten the average collection time. Entry fees is another big part of the unrestricted revenues that the courts collect. They are set by court rules, so they are not set in statute. The courts determine the entry fee amount, and they range um, from $45 to around $225. And small claims is very common. Uh, civil cases, family, landlord, tenant, those types of um, entry fees are very common for the courts. And 64% of entry fees are deposited to the general fund. And then the remaining 36% um, is split two ways. 30% goes to the IT dedicated fund, again, which the judicial branch controls. And then 6% is sent to facilities escrow. And that is also on our book. And facilities escrow is just money that's there in case we have some um, type of facilities um, improvement or a repair that needs to get done. And there are no other funds for it. We will go to that fund in conjunction with um, the Bureau of Court Facilities. Um, just as a note, um, some filing fees can be waived that will affect revenues. Um, judges have the option to waive filing fees if a person can demonstrate that they cannot afford uh, to pay their fee. Because again, this is about access to justice. Uh, we've also noted uh, when we do increase revenue uh, filing fee amounts, it tends to result in an increased number of requests for a waiver of the fee. I believe the last time we increased our filing fees was back in 2014, I wanna say, I'm not exactly sure, but it's been a while since we've actually adjusted um, filing fee amount. And then as I had mentioned earlier, another big portion of our unrestricted revenues falls into what we call other fees. And right now, records research fees, it ranges between probably 65 and 75% of what deposits to other fees. And as I've noted in the last probably few years of giving this presentation uh, before House Ways and Means, there has been talk of making online uh, public access to, um, to records research fees. And that would obviously affect our, our ability to collect revenue for it. So just wanted to put that out there. Again, I haven't heard anything that's really happening with it, but it may be something we'll be dealing with in the future. And then motions and petitions are another portion of what deposits into other fees. And those range from, <coughs> excuse me, $25 to $250. We also charge a $25 surcharge on many of our civil and family case um, filings but we don't in certain case types. So criminal, juvenile, um, small claims, domestic violence, those types of things. But that $25 surcharge, again, deposits to the general fund in this other fees category. We also charge a $25 setup fee for time payments. That also deposits um, as unrestricted fees in, in this other fees category. This next slide is just a summary of the different types of unrestricted revenues that the court collect by um, revenue account and a description of it with some history as well. And next slide is sort of a five-year history of these different um, unrestricted revenue streams. And I did a compound annual growth rate as well to kind of gauge how the funds have done. And default fees collected by safety have actually remained fairly stable. And again, that's the $50 fee similar to ours that if you've defaulted, if you paid safety with a bad check or something in order to reinstate, you have to pay that $50 fee. So again, it's remained remarkably stable um, over the last five years. Our exam fees, I think also for the most part will remain the same. And just as a caveat, I think the name of that account is bar exam fees. We do not actually collect the fees for the bar exam any longer, but there are, I think, $10 fees for a, um, an, a good standing that the courts require if you're going to litigate a case in this state, that type of thing. That's what that revenue is. And then uh, the e-filing surcharge, that's a, a, either a $10 or $20 surcharge that is tacked on to the, um, the filing that is done online. 
And you can see sort of the, the growth there, though, is due to ramp up. So you can see in fiscal year 2016, we had less case types that were online than you had in 18, 19, and 20. And I think it's kind of stabilized at this point. New Hampshire has mandatory um, filing for those case types that are available online. So now that we've had all the case types that are going to be online for a while, I think you will see that uh, remain fairly stable in the next couple of fiscal years. If we were to uh, introduce other case types online, you would then see an increase in that revenue stream. Interest is obviously so small, <laughs> it doesn't really have much of an impact, even though it went from $33 in 2016 to about a dollar in fiscal year 20. I'm not too worried about that decline. Um, fines um, have decreased uh, around 20% year over year since fiscal year 2016. One of the things that did have a big impact on that was what we called the decriminalization of marijuana because a lot of those fines that were associated with um, possession of marijuana were fairly high, $500 and up. With the um, decriminalization of marijuana, even when there is a fine involved, it tends to be much smaller. So it did have quite a significant impact. Um, you can see between fiscal year 17 and fiscal year 18, and then a little bit more into 19. The next category is bail forfeiture. And that one is a little hard to predict because that's all dependent upon human behavior, who forfeits their bail because they didn't show up for their court hearing. So I don't really know how one can predict that very well. So, but it's around, it's ranged from $276,000 know, to around $111,000. But again, it will vary. I think year to year is tough to predict that one. Entry fees um, have remained fairly stable. Again, I think at the onset of the pandemic, the first few months, right, April, May, and June, I think everybody was reeling from the impact of it, trying to adjust and understand uh, how it would impact things. So we did see a dip um, in fiscal year 20 in the last quarter, but I think we're starting to see them rebound um, as things have stabilized a bit. Default fees collected by the courts, again, that's that $50, excuse me, $50 fee. Should somebody um, pay their court fine with a bad check or not show up for their hearing, whatever, they have to pay that additional $50 fee. Other fees, again, that has remained um, remarkably strong, I think, um, over uh, the fiscal years. And I think part of it is, I think the economy has done still fairly well. And we've all suffered because of the pandemic, but I think New Hampshire has fared fairly well. Um, and also in terms of housing, I think housing remains strong. And so records research fees are requested, I think, a lot of times for um, looking to rent to somebody or looking to hire someone. So we've seen a fairly stable uh, in that line. And then there's uh, miscellaneous sales and revenue. And that has actually gone down quite a bit. And that was due to a change in our procedure with those funds. Um, it used to be that we would... Um, we would have funds that were unclaimed. So people paid bail or whatever they paid. And for whatever reason, we couldn't locate the owner of that money. It used to be that after three tries of not being able to locate the owner, we would automatically send that money over as revenue to the general fund in this miscellaneous revenue account. We realized then that we were not following statutes as regard to how we should be treating that money. We now, as of November um, 2017, we hold that money as unclaimed for three years in an escrow account. Then if we were not able to locate the owner after that three year period, it then becomes abandoned property. Right. And then it will deposit to the general fund. We're now getting to that three year mark. And we actually did an analysis last week. We don't have any monies actually in the next few months. Uh, we've been able to return funds to people, but in April, we're gonna have money that has aged three years it will then be deposited to the general fund. And you'll see on the next slide, I've been able to do an analysis to get a sense of the most that we would send to the general fund. Obviously, I think between now and the time these funds become three years, we'll be able to locate some more owners. So the money, the, the amounts may come down a little bit, but that's why you see that drop. It was a change in procedure. And then uh, penalty assessments, again, um, we have seen just a steady decline. You see a zero in 2016 because, again, that money was actually um, 
going to police standards and training. So it was not hitting uh, unrestricted revenue. But as of 2017, it did. And we have seen a steady decline in penalty assessments. And I know I get asked every year why I think that is. Um, and it's, I'm sure it's a combination of things. Um, it may be, you know, raising the speed limit in some parts of the state to 70 miles an hour. Maybe less tickets are being uh, issued as a result of that. Um, are, you know, as we are a fairly gray state, are we getting better behaved as we get older? I, I don't know, but um, we just, I cannot obviously deny that there is a general trend here of declining revenues. And then the last revenue that we collect is the motor vehicle fines. Um, again, if you have a plea by mail that you want to contest or you can't pay your fine by plea by mail, you have to pay it at the court. Uh, and we have seen, again, a steady decline, even pre-pandemic. Obviously, I think the the pandemic has affected the number of vehicles on the road significantly. I think a lot of people, myself included, are working from home quite a bit. So we have seen, um, you know, an impact to that revenue stream as a result of just more people being home because of the pandemic. So our next slide then looks at uh, where we project uh, revenues to be for the, through the end of this fiscal year, as well as 22 and 23. And as I kind of alluded to, I think some of these revenue streams are more vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic than others. Um, I think motor vehicle type um, amounts are gonna be more impacted. You can see it in defaults collected by safety and our motor vehicle fines. Um, safety is projecting for fiscal year 21, $688,000 in revenues as opposed to they're around 800 plus thousand each year. Um, Bar exam fees, again, I don't think is going to be impacted all that much. Again, e-filing, I think, will also be fairly immune because it is online by nature. Um, and then for fines, I looked at sort of a general trend for the last three years to see what might be happening in terms of it. And I did the same thing with bail forfeitures. Again, very difficult to predict on that one. Entry fees, I'm hoping, will stabilize again. Uh, I, I just think we had a, a severe hit in the last quarter of fiscal year 20. But now I think we're, we're kind of going into an upward trend on that and hopefully we'll stabilize in the next year or two with that. Uh, default fees collected by the courts. Again, a little tough to predict. I'm looking at around the 120 range to be conservative. Uh, other fees, again, that's a lot of records research which has continued to be strong. So I'm actually looking at a fairly healthy return on that um, for this fiscal year. And there might be, I'm thinking maybe a little bit of a downward trend in 22 and 23. I just don't know. I want, I'd rather be a little conservative to, and see what happens and be pleasantly surprised rather than be too optimistic about uh, what those revenues may come in at. And then miscellaneous sales, this is, as I talked about before, what you're seeing in 21 is as of today, what's going to be three years old in fiscal year 21. And then for 22, around $22,000 is going to be three years old. And then around 91,000 in fiscal year 23. Those, that's a maximum amount. Those numbers will probably come down, as I mentioned, as we find um, owners of those funds. And then penalty assessments. Again, I think we're going to see a bit of a, a rebound, I'm hoping. Um, but the general overall trend with PAs is that they are coming down. So I tried to reflect that in my 22 and 23 figures as well. At some point, though, it's got a bottom out. I just don't know where that bottom is. I've just seen it year over year continuing to decline. But you would think at some point, you know, it can't go much further down if, if people are, if police are giving out tickets and assessing other fines for things. Again, I just, I don't know enough about all the drivers of that to, to predict when it may bottom out. And then motor vehicle fines, again, there's a, a general trend downward. Um, I'm hoping with fiscal year 21, again, we're still seeing the impact of the pandemic. In 22, I've raised the projection. Some of that I'm attributing to backlog. The courts have obviously been challenged with um, switching to remote models to conduct their business. So there was a big culture change and a lot of technology that had to be implemented to allow us to do that. 
Um, but I think we're in a much better place to conduct our business, but we still have a lot of catch up to do. So there is quite a bit of backlog of cases. And so I'm hoping that we will see an uptick in revenues that follow the ability of the courts to process those cases and get the revenue in. But then I think ultimately, once we get done with that backlog, we're probably going to see a little bit of a decline again in revenues. And that's why you see a difference between 22 and 23. And then the last page um, is just footnotes about this. I think most of them I talked about, but just to help explain what, what some of that revenue is about um, and how it's distributed. So if the committee has any questions, um, Director Keating and I will be happy to answer them. Well, thank you, Donna. Very good presentation. Uh, questions from the committee? I do not see any raised hands. Okay. And we're right on time. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, Representative Mary, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I could just ask quickly, Donna, about your slide related to the waivers. Uh, you said that you noticed that there's a bit of an increase in waivers being granted by judges. Could you speak a little bit about the year to year trend that you're seeing? I think that is more anecdotal. Um, it's what we've heard from judges and their experience. So I don't actually have data for that. And I'm it's very difficult to um, record that because we need to see what the actual fine was. And that, that information may be in our Odyssey case system, but I'm not sure that it gets down to that level of granularity. Um, but it, it tends to make sense um, that, you know, the more you start asking for, you know, payments, the more people are going to come forward and say, I can't afford this. But I just wanted to put it out there that it, it is part of the dynamic of uh, revenues that we end up collecting. Thank you. Any further <laughs> questions? Then I thank uh, both Donner and, and Christopher for a presentation on the judicial branch. Thank you. We're right on time, so we can start with the Department of Health and Human Services. And Karen Rounds, the Chief Financial, Financial Officer, will be making the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And, and Karen, did you send over a, a copy of your slides? Or I did. I sent it over to Chris yesterday morning. Um, so I'm not sure if he sent that out via email or uh, has posted it to the website. Maybe he could chime in and just let you know that. It is on the website. So all the presentations that you have scheduled today and tomorrow should all be on our website. OK. Great. And I will just apologize in advance. You will hear uh, background noise here. I am at the state's emergency operations center. So uh, you will hear background noise. Um, <laughs> so this presentation uh, does not encompass all of the revenues for DHHS for a number of reasons. Uh, one, um, we have over 200 revenue sources, the largest of which being the uh, the Medicaid program, uh, which is in various accounting units all across our department. Um, and then, like I said, there's over 200 total between small grants that are 10, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to larger grants that are tens of millions of dollars, like the state opioid response grant. Um, I did two years ago say that we were working on a report to show you all of those restricted revenue sources. Uh, COVID has, as you can imagine, put a, um, a bit of a damper on many of our longer strategic planning projects. And we unfortunately did not have that completed for this biennium, but I am hoping for next one when uh, COVID is hopefully in our distant past. So this, um, report here uh, that I had prepared for you shows the number of things. On this first section that I'm showing you here on the screen, on the left-hand side is a chart of the actuals, and the right-hand side is the chart of the budget. Note that it doesn't line up perfectly as far as uh, um, just sort of following the chart because the actuals ends at, at fiscal year 20 because we are currently in fiscal year 21, and the budget goes through to fiscal year 23. 
A couple of things to note here um, is that you do see decreasing unrestricted revenue over the past several years. The reason for that is a change in the uh, managed care contracts that the department has, which are the contracts that manage our Medicaid program. And that, those contracts change the way um, that the uh, recoveries are managed and that the MCOs, the managed care organizations, are required to manage those recoveries within their work, which results in a savings on the contract to the state, but also a decrease in the amount of unrestricted revenue. So that's really what you see reflected here. What I'd also note here is that um, one thing that's not included in the DHHS unrestricted revenue, but is included in the other unrestricted revenue um, on your overall unrestricted revenue sheets are the restaurant fees. So um, we do provide estimates on that to uh, the governor's office and to the LBA, but those are not included in the line that's labeled DHHS unrestricted revenue. Um, there's a couple of pie charts here just for visuals uh, if you want to take a look at those later. The other thing that we have here is all of the revenue sources um, Sorry, over the uh, past several years. Um, and you will see, like we talked about, that decline in the recoveries happening over the past several years because of the change in the contracts. Otherwise, our other revenues and unrestricted revenues tend to stay fairly stable. On this page, um, just to let you know what's in the other unrestricted revenues, as you can see, it is a various amount of small fees um, and expenditures. There is also um, just a chart showing you, again, the unrestricted revenues of that 1.2 million that's various, that, that has decreased a little bit over time, but not substantially. There's also on this last page, a description of each of the revenue sources. So I know this has been very high level. I'm gonna go ahead and just scroll back up to the first page because I think these two charts are probably the most helpful in your analysis. Um, I also have several people on the line who are familiar with each of the revenue sources who can provide more information. Um, so I'm gonna go on mute for a few moments because I know that I do have a ton of background noise here and give you guys a second just to look at it and see if there are any questions. Representative Major, I muted you. I thought you were talking, I'm sorry. You left to unmute yourself. Representative Major, I muted you. I, I thought you were on a phone call. You'll have to unmute. Okay. Sorry. Questions. So we have Representative Elmi. Unmute, Susan. I'm muted, sorry. Um, I can't figure out how chart one relates to chart two. The budget doesn't seem to be the same as the unrestricted revenue. Yes. It's got different numbers. Yep, the chart on the left is the actuals. Um, the chart on the right is the budget. So actuals have tended to trend a little bit higher than what we've budgeted, with the exception of um, 2018 and 19. Um, if you look, we came in at about 6 million. It was budgeted at 9 million. That was a budgeting error that year. Um, last year in fiscal year 20, the actuals were about 4.8 million. And you can see over here, they were budgeted at 3.7. And in fiscal year 21, we are trending to, um, to receive at least what is budgeted, if not a little bit more. Uh, you know, there's a there's a joke that it's not a joke, but it is that you occasionally hear that in HHS, um, a half a million dollars is a rounding error. Uh, it, and so for us, um, you know, this coming in where it is, and like I said, where you expect this will be a little bit higher, um, but it's not like tens of millions of dollars higher. Maybe there'll be a couple hundred thousand. You said that in 2018, the budget amount was wrong. It, what would it be? It should have been closer to this 
it, we probably would have budgeted it at about five million. Um, it came in at about six million. That was uh, that was uh, a double budgeting issue that we made when we submitted the governor's budget that was not caught through the phases. Part of the recoveries are actually federal funds. It's not just general funds. So we recover twice the amount, but we have to return a portion of that to the federal government. So 19 would be the same case too, right? Yes, it was 18 and 19 that that budget error was made. That those were both budgeted at 9.1 million and that came in at 6.2. All right. Uh, strange that you would show this, but okay. Uh, further questions, uh, Representative Elliott. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I was wondering, I could hear Karen's voice and I could also hear a man's voice. I'm getting two voices on my computer. Is someone got a TV on or a radio or what? No, sir, that's me. I'm sorry. I'm at the state's emergency operations center. You're hearing Perry Plummer in the background with the commissioner. I'm sorry okay. about that. Thank you, Karen. That explains it. Uh, Representative Almey, you'll have to unmute Susan. Sorry, I just wanted to point out that Representative Murphy had a question about the uh, distribution of the MET money, and we were told that maybe this afternoon she could deal with it. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and allow uh, Chris to bring Meredith um, and Brooke into the conversation because they are better suited to answer your questions on that than I am. Mine would be the 100,000 foot view and they can certainly give you the 10,000 foot view. Before you do that, could you send a corrected, or well, what's supposed to be to replace that graph where on 18 and 19 or shows, you said it wasn't at 9.1, but it was closer. No, so it, that is actually representing the amount that was budgeted. We just oh. budgeted it incorrectly. It was unfortunately too high. All right, okay. Go ahead. All right, I see Brooke and Meredith have joined. So if you wanna go ahead and ask her a question, I think we'll be good. You want me to ask the question again? Uh, yes. Oh, this is Jim Murphy. Thank you. Um, my question was, uh, it was more of a historical question as to where and where we stand now regarding the DISH MET payments. I remember when this started 30 years ago, um, it was meant to obviously help um, those hospitals that took care of a lot of um, uh, charity care or Medicaid patients that weren't paying the, the, the rate uh, for cost of the patient in the hospital. And initially, my understanding was that for every dollar, say, in met tax, the government or the state of New Hampshire would receive another dollar from the Fed, and then that same dollar would go back to the hospitals. So for about 10 years, it was really a, a zero-sum game for hospitals. But I think that has slipped. And I was just wondering, if you have this information, what percentage of met actually does return to hospitals for care of indigent patients? And Medicaid patients. Good afternoon, Representative. Uh, I'm Meredith Tellus with the Department of Health and Human Services and happy to answer your question. You're quite right in that historically that was the mechanism the state used. Um, and today we are operating the MET DISH program under a settlement agreement with our hospitals. Um, and according to that settlement, the hospitals in total, not each hospital specifically, but in total, in aggregate, 26 hospitals, not including the rehab hospitals, receive back 91% of the amount that they pay in MET. So as you noted, the state receives the MET, it is matched with federal dollars, and then they would receive back 91% of the amount that they paid so to make it real simple, um, they would pay in a uh, hundred million dollars in MET. They would get back ninety-one million. 
Thank you. Yep, absolutely. You have a further question, Representative Murphy? One of them was, in, in, and I think it's been somewhat of a contentious issue among the 26 hospitals as to the uh, allocation of the dish payment. And I was wondering if that formula is, is becoming more refined or changing going forward, um, or there, is, is there any real change in the structure of the allocation of dish monies? Or are you asking what's the percentage difference between the less paid hospital versus the highest paid? Or, or simply trying to match the, um, the, the dish payment to hospitals relative to their um, care of either Medicaid patients or charity care or no pay type patients. So I was just wondering if there is any change in the way it's being allocated going forward or is this the same formula? HHS? The formula, yes, thank you for the question. The, the formula has changed, I'll say, as the federal definition um, changed. However, currently under our settlement agreement, we have uh, defined with the hospitals the amount that they will receive back in net. And so they receive that amount back, that 91% I referred to, whether it's made as a dish payment or another form of Medicaid payment. Mm -hmm. So they will still receive back the same amount, even if the definition of uncompensated care changes, which it has over the years. Good. Thank you. Further questions? Chris, wasn't there another question uh, for HHS? Oh. There was a question related to the um, nursing homes and the bed tax. Edie and Susan have their hands up. Uh, Representative Almy. Thank you. I actually had a question related to the previous answer. Hi, Meredith. It's really good to hear you again anyway. On, you too, Representative. So we used to to give them back everything they'd got and then use, they paid and then use the excess around until the feds told us we couldn't uh, use it around uh, Medicaid and such. And is the current 9% surplus also put into general attempts to keep up our Medicaid obligations? Yes, that's used in our general Medicaid account. I think I better um, give way to Edith before I ask my question about nursing homes again. So you're all through, Representative Almy. I had a second question, but I thought Representative Tucker had her hand up before I remembered nursing homes. I don't see her, her hand up. Her hand is up, I can see it. Oh, you need to do, you need to, she's asking me to, to, to do the question on nursing homes first. Um, okay. But I think we got, actually, I remember now we got that answered. Okay. I, I see Representative Tucker now. So go ahead, Representative Tucker. You'll have to unmute. I'm going to ask a more amorphous question. Up here in the North Country particularly, we hear a lot uh, from families and from uh, communities, from selectmen, about people who aren't being fully served. And it's always hard to know, trying to match the revenues and the needs, how do we know as legislators or how do we know as good will citizens of New Hampshire that our most vulnerable people are in fact being served, that there is enough revenue. Mm -hmm. I, it's a huge agency with a tremendous number of responsibilities. So how, how would, if you were a legislator, what would you look for to find the answer to that question? 
I think that the best um, place for those types of questions is really the Health and Human Services Oversight Committee. The commissioner regularly attends that meeting. Um, you know, my perspective is mostly from a finance perspective and not from a programmatic perspective where the commissioner, um, you know, really has an overview of program and finance, right, to be able to answer that question. Um, so I I think that that committee is probably best for that type of question. So how often does the oversight committee meet? Uh, Chris, I'm not sure if you remember, but I want to say it's at least once a month. It's on Fridays, um, and I don't remember the exact time. I, I don't, Karen, remember exactly. I know they meet. I think it's monthly is correct, but I also think they meet as needed. So there may be times of the year where they do meet more frequently. I think the pandemic has taken its toll and people are very worried. So thank you very much. Understandably, um, you're welcome. So, uh, uh, Karen, uh, is there any reason why somebody from your department couldn't ask that question of them and get that information for the committee? Um, we we certainly can do that. I just I I'm just concerned that it's not the best. Um, I'm just concerned about the context. I I think that the oversight committee is the better committee to discuss that. But certainly, uh, if we um, maybe if Representative Tucker, you don't mind putting the question in writing, I can uh, bring it to my commissioner and pro provide a response back in writing. Fine. Um, any further questions? Uh, do you have anything else, uh, Commissioner? Uh, I'm sorry. I am, I am thankfully not the Commissioner Chief, of the Chief Department. Fin Chief Financial Officer. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Um, no, I do not have anything else. But if anyone has any follow-up questions, please do feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions. All right, there's no other hands then we have about seven minutes before the next presentation. And we thank you, uh, Karen, and, and the others for the information you did provide to the committee. You're very welcome. I do have a reputation of talking a little fast through presentations. So uh, I'm glad you got six minutes back, but I hope that um, I didn't confuse anyone. So thank you again. You're welcome. All right, we will uh, be back at two o'clock. Could I ask you a question? Uh, yes. Do you expect that we're going to be voting on any bills on Thursday? It depends if we have any bills that uh, it's clear cut that we're all in agreement on. Yes. If, uh, if not, we won't be. So it'll be divided into three areas. The first area, if it's clear cut that we have an agreement on to either ITL or pass as is without any amendment, we'll do it. And then pass, but with an amendment, then we'll have to wait for the amendment. The other is, is it, is it something that it's in, it's really, re, it's interesting but we don't have enough information and we need more, then it would be a candidate to retain. Good. And the other, able, one, the other one, the other one is clear, if everybody agrees uh, to ITL, fine, or uh, ought to pass. And the other, the last category is one that we have part of the committee agrees one way and part of the group committee agrees the other way. Um, it might be one we might want to handle as a committee as a whole before we make a, a, a decision one way or the other. So it's up to the, the people that do the presenting to convince everybody to, to go for it or, or their presentation says, hey, everybody wants to kill this. So, all right. Thank you. And then there'll be those that, um, let's say there's different opinions on both sides. We won't exact that right away. We'll give an opportunity for 
the caucuses to be able to meet and discuss. And then maybe we might be able to work something out between the caucuses. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other general questions? Um, looks like a good amount of people on Thursday will be doing it virtually, which, which I feel is probably better. And those that will be appearing, we're going to meet in room 206, 208. It'll be combined into one room on Thursday. Those that decide that they want to participate in person. Tomorrow will be similar to today, but it should be a, just a little bit shorter. Let's see, we've got five more minutes. So go to my book here. Mr. Glennon is here, just so you know. Mr. Mr. Glennon, the new the uh, director of Securities Bureau. Just okay. Let right. you be aware of that. That's all. Right. Okay. Okay. So tomorrow we're going to hit from the insurance department at nine. From the, uh, from the Department of Safety at ten. Department of Transportation at eleven. Fishing game at eleven thirty. Then at one o'clock the Department of Administrative Services and two o'clock the Treasury Department. After we get through with the agency head for this turnaround, then we're going to start getting into the work, the meat of our work and go into work sessions and then go through these revenue streams one by one. And what I'm anticipating, and I hope it happens that way, is that everybody, the new as well as those that have been on the committee for a while, participate. Because as we go through looking at each of these revenues, we'll end up wanting to know what is your opinion on this particular revenue? What do you think the range will be? So everybody should be able to contribute what they think their range is going to be based upon everything that they've heard from the economists and from the agency heads or wherever else. And that way uh, we get the most broadest amount of information to consider. Uh, that seemed to have worked in the past. And then we'll look at the ranges and make a decision of how we wanted to come up with the final decision. But you want to be prepared to defend why you think it's going to go this high or that low. So don't think you're going to be just a member of the committee to listen. You want to, you want to listen, but you, you want to make a contribution to it too. That's the only way you really get to learn because it forces you to ask the questions and there's no stupid question. We have two more minutes. Any further questions? I do, Norm. Representative Schamberg here. Yes. Go ahead, Representative Schamberg. You're muted again, Tom. Tom, you're muted. I'm you getting go. there, Jen. I'm getting there. I'm not I'm a yellow person, paper person. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh. We, we still good or not? You're good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Norm, uh, what door do we come in and at the LOB? Uh, okay. The side door or front? Yes. Please let me know. The, um, the front door of the LOB, you can't come in because there's construction going on. You okay. can come in through the side door or through the, uh, the park. Back entrance. Okay. Now you could also come in from the Park Street entrance on into the State House and then through the tunnel. But at okay. the time you come in, uh, if you come in through the State House, there'll be a guard there. They'll do the screening, and then you can proceed into the tunnel. If you come in through Park Street, 
into the LOB, uh, you will be screened by uh, one of the security, the same way as if you come through the parking lot. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Now it is two o'clock. And good, uh, we have Ber um, Barry Glennon, the director of the Security Bureau of the, of the Department of State. And Barry, it's your time now. If you want to sh share your screen, go ahead. Maybe he's muted. No. Can you uh, hear me, uh, Representative Major? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, terrific. All right. I can see you too. No, you, great. <laughs> Progress. I'm literally just right over here at the uh, Annex building, um, but it seems like we're tens of miles away when it comes to uh, technology, so I'm, I'm glad we came through. I wasn't so successful with uh, the Commerce Committee uh, last week. So I'm really excited at this point. Hey, we're all new at this. So. Yes, yes. I, I was reminded of that by Representative Hunt. Um, he was very forgiving. Well, thank you uh, very much, um, Mr. Chair, uh, for in, inviting me uh, to uh, present this afternoon regarding uh, Bureau of Securities uh, revenue um, and uh, projected revenue, um, you know, well into uh, 2023. Uh, I thought it might be helpful for some of the newer members, um, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, who may not necessarily be acquainted with the Bureau, just to give a very, very brief 50-slide um, presentation on the Bureau. I'm just kidding. Just a very brief presentation about uh, the Bureau, and then I think that'll help put in proper context uh, the uh, revenue sources uh, that we have, um, and, and certainly uh, answer any questions that uh, the committee may have. Um, if, if I may, I'd like to uh, share a uh, screen here to just kick off. I believe that uh, uh, Christopher also has provided and uploaded these um, to, uh, to the committee uh, so they can be uh, viewed online uh, or shared on, online. Let me just uh, expand this out and uh, I'll be with you in just one second. Here we go. You're seeing that now in full screen? Hey. You're better at this than some others. Oh, all right. Well, you were able to put it on and then expand it. All right. Very little practice here. Uh, my wife actually did a tutorial with me yesterday. She's a teacher. <laughs> She's te teaching remote. Well, partly. Well, um, the Bureau of, of Securities Regulation is organized under uh, the uh, Secretary of State's office. I report to, to Secretary Gardner. We are responsible for the a regulatory oversight of broker dealers, investment advisors, uh, as well as the registration of securities that are sold uh, in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, the, our major functions, again, very quickly, are licensing of, of these entities, uh, the registration of securities. We're also responsible for conducting uh, uh, unannounced in-person exams of the uh, branch offices of these firms uh, throughout the state. We also have an investor education uh, function, which is written right into the statute where we go out and, and meet with members of the public and also on radio or television to help promote uh, investor protection and, and investor safety. Uh, and then perhaps our most important role is uh, the, the enforcement component and that is enforcing RSA 421B. Um, and it is really through the enforcement that is really one of the one of our sources of revenue. It's not general fund revenue. However, we are a self-funded agency um, with a staff of 12. So uh, we do rely upon the fines and penalties that are derived from enforcement actions uh, to uh, fund our operation. Uh, in terms of our overall volume of activity, uh, we have there are approximately 1,200 uh, licensed broker dealers that we oversee. More surprisingly, uh, over 118,000 registered representatives licensed to do business in New Hampshire. And just as a point of clarification, they're not all residents here in New Hampshire. That would be about the population of Manchester. But 
they are uh, licensed to solicit into the state of New Hampshire, which, which is what triggers the license. It varies. Some, very, some, somehow your voice drops to almost nothing. Oh. It comes back up. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll try to, to speak a little bit louder. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and then in, in terms of investment advisors, as you can see, uh, roughly uh, 2,300 investment advisors, uh, and of course, their agent representatives. Uh, they perform a slightly different function than broker dealers, um, uh, which I can explain, but uh, perhaps uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll jump into some of the more salient parts. Um, in terms of our audits, uh, they're very thorough. Uh, we do only charge $100 per uh, per day per examination of firms. Uh, however, um, it's it's fair and reasonable in relation to uh, other states. Uh, but we do have a, a two full time auditors out there. During pandemic, we've had to resort more towards uh, desk audits, uh, simply because uh, the firms have been uh, hesitant to have anyone inside, and then many of them are actually working uh, remotely. Uh, enforcement is, as I said, is, is a significant source of uh, revenue for operating the Bureau, uh, but also the most active component with, you know, at least 70 complaints and 40 enforcement actions uh, annually. Uh, we also have administrative hearings at a hearings officer. Uh, and then um, we're also a source of information for the public in, in terms of questions they may have about maybe lost uh, uh, stock certificates or uh, just general questions about their investments. So we, we perform that. And more significantly though, and I think the purpose, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, of course, of our of meeting today is to talk about uh, securities revenue. Um, and as you would, had asked the five-year uh, summary of revenue, as you can see from the chart here, there really, there are two primary uh, buckets of, of, of revenue. First is broker-dealer investment a broker dealer and investment advisor fees, and the second being securities registrations. And I can certainly explain both. Uh, broker dealers and investment advisor fees, those are the firms that do business in the state, as well as the 118,000 agent representatives. So we derive a fair amount of revenue from that source. Uh, as you can see in uh, 2020, uh, it was 16.6 .6 million. Um, over the course of five years, it has uh, increased uh, significantly. Uh, I would attribute that uh, growth over that period really due to a booming uh, economy, as well as uh, just overall investments, as people may have seen in their own 401ks and IRAs. Uh, there's been significant growth with regard to broker dealers and their representatives. Uh, same for uh, in investment advisors. However, on the securities registration side, as you can see, there's been a bit of a fluctuation over the past five years from 2016 to 2020, ranging anywhere from 24 to $29 million. Uh, this is largely due to market fluctuations uh, and the offering of private securities products. Uh, it's really part of the whole capital formation activity where companies are going out uh, to raise money or they're not raising money, uh, or there's uh, been an expansion in terms of uh, entrepreneurs uh, seeking to raise capital. Whenever they do that, they have, and they're making a public offering, they have to actually file with the state the offering that, that they intend to solicit and sell in state. So that has varied. Also, mutual funds are a component, a significant component, I might add, in terms of securities registrations. Uh, we have well over 22,000 mutual funds that are registered in New Hampshire, which is not unusual with, uh, in comparison to other states because most funds will offer in all 50 states. Uh, that number does vary, and I do see a slight decrease uh, coming into uh, 2022 uh, for that reason. Uh, also, there have been changes on the federal level with regard to mutual funds. Uh, it's known as the Regulation BI Best Interest. And what that is, is that um, any kind of, let's say, 401k plans, whenever they offer mutual funds within the plan itself, the rule now is that you have to pro provide products that are in the best interest of the customer. And oftentimes, best interest means the lowest rate uh, fund, lowest cost fund. And so we've seen a bit of a contraction in the mutual fund industry where they've eliminated some of the higher fee 
mutual funds and going with more of the reduced fee, you know, 50 basis points, uh, 100 basis point uh, type funds. So there's been a slight reduction in mutual fund filings, but it does fluctuate, as I said, and I do anticipate uh, recovery. Uh, and COVID has been a factor as well, with, with certainly with the overall securities filings. Uh, and I, I'm hopeful for a recovery. I'm, I'm actually most certain of, of that, that it'll occur in each of these two categories. Uh, as far as the certification fees um, that you can see in the column, that was eliminated by the legislature. Was rule, they were called Rule 506 offerings, uh, securities offerings. Uh, renewal fees were charged. Uh, that was eliminated by uh, the legislature uh, uh, back in six, uh, 18, I believe. Six, no, 17. Uh, and then bail bondsmen, there's been a steady decrease in that, which is a really small source of revenue. We do regulate bail bondsmen. Uh, however, with bail reform, a number of the bondsmen have actually left the industry. And I think we're only down to two bail bondsmen uh, throughout the state, which is unfortunate. But that has been you know, a result of court reform and, and changes in, in bail statutes. So as far as overall projected revenue, as, as you can see, um, I uh, anticipate that uh, we will uh, end uh, 2021 at approximately uh, $41.250 uh, million. Uh, and then an increase over uh, the next two years uh, as we see more broker dealers coming back post COVID, uh, opening more branch offices, registering more uh, registered representatives and investment advisors. Uh, so that contraction I, I, I believe is just temporary due to people, registered representatives leaving the industry uh, and maybe working from home and deciding it's really not working and leaving, not re-registering, uh, but returning. So the, the picture uh, does look, look better uh, as we go forward. Um, and I believe that that, um, Mr. Chair, is uh, essentially uh, 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 a review of what we see uh, for revenue uh, coming forward this year as well as the next two fiscal years. And I'd be happy to answer any questions of the committee. Thank you, Barry, for your presentation. And we have questions from the committee. Uh, Representative Ames. You'll have to unmute, uh, Derek. Yeah, I got it. Um, so thank you for that good presentation. Uh, so my question is about enforcement actions and uh, you mentioned those are significant. I, I assume a significant activity in your department or agency. And um, it, I wondered if you could provide us with an example or two of sort of the major kinds of enforcement actions that you'd be engaged in and what kind of money's involved? Certainly, they, they really do range um, uh, in, in terms of the types of cases that we typically see. It's really the sale of products that are not suitable for the particular investor. Um, there are some times where agents, agent representatives may engage in activity that is not appropriate. In other words, they may do what we call churning, where they're over trading the account, they're constantly uh, selling mutual fund or, or proposing one uh, for the purchase and then the sale of it in a very short time period and then then recommending another another product and again they get a commission each and every time they do that that's called churning and um, it's it's uh, not allowed it's really not a suitable sales practice whatsoever um, there's also fraud that occurs uh, licensed individuals but more so that we see those who are not licensed they may have been in the industry at one point. Uh, they left the industry. However, they never bothered to tell their clients that. Or, or they sell products that are very speculative uh, over the internet, again, on an unlicensed basis, and uh, ultimately results in you know, significant losses. And in terms of the victims that, that we see, uh, they can really vary. Um, it could be uh, an elderly couple um, that has uh, maybe uh, $100,000, let's say, in their overall savings uh, that was uh, squandered and, and swindled away by someone, some unscrupulous uh, person. Uh, and then we have at the opposite end of the range, some that are relatively wealthy individuals 
um, who uh, are, are likewise often and sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> not always, taken advantage of. I think the, probably the most uh, interesting case that we've had this year, this fiscal year, actually involved uh, former, former uh, New Hampshire Governor uh, Craig Benson, where um, he experienced difficulty with uh, his brokerage firm. And that resulted in the return of well over, I think it was maybe 22 million back to, uh, uh, to the governor who was a victim in, in this case. So it, it really does range. We, I mean, not, uh, uh, not to boast, but I'm very proud of, of what the Bureau does. And I can just tell you, Representative, that, that we make sure that the same attention is afforded to the individual that lost maybe what we might consider a small sum as a, in even the larger uh, losses as well. We treat them equally uh, because it represents their assets. It represents their livelihood and their retirement. Many, many cases, their retirement. Thank you so much. That's very helpful to have a picture of what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, Representative uh, Mary Aiken. Uh, yeah. Phillips. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's um, Representative Mary Hacken Phillips here. And I was just wondering, um, let's see, Barry, I remember you said at the outset of your presentation that there were two auditors. Maybe you could give the uh, committee a sense of how many um, staff members are within the Bureau and then how many of those staff members are for uh, designated for enforcement purposes. Sure, we have, uh, we have two full-time auditors. Uh, well, actually, first start, we have a staff of 12 and that starts from the receptionist to me. Um, so there are two auditors and then we also have five staff attorneys who are assigned to uh, the enforcement unit. Uh, because in their attorneys, because uh, we are dealing with, you know, essentially lawyers, when we file an action against a broker dealer firm, uh, more often than not, they're hiring some of the big guns, as I might call, call them, some of the larger firms, uh, even, you know, local firms, uh, national firms, international firms that represent some of these uh, larger broker dealers and investment advisors. So it's, the process has evolved over the years, certainly uh, far more litigious uh, in terms of their defense of their clients. Uh, so we really do need to have you know, trained and seasoned lawyers uh, to uh, address these uh, cases. If I could just ask a quick follow up with that. Um, what is the coordination on the federal level from the state you know, in terms of proceeding with these enforcement actions? What kind of yes, um, actually, it's a very, very good question, and I, I, I hope, hopefully, I won't confuse uh, the committee on this. But there are really three levels in terms of securities regulation in the U.S. We're all acquainted with the SEC. Uh, the SEC is essentially the overall federal government overseer of the markets uh, and of those who sell products uh, throughout the country. So the SEC is primarily focused on large public companies, their public filings, uh, as well as some of the major cases. They very rarely, and I say I should really kind of couch my remarks, I don't want to overstep here, but they, they rarely do not engage with some of the smaller investors on the state level. They relegate that really to the 50 state regulators. So we tend to take more of the local type actions um, where th that involve New Hampshire investors. The intermediary is called FINRA, uh, which is a self-regulatory organization that broker dealers must belong to. It's a member-based organization. Uh, it's really kind of a subset of the SEC. They're overseen by the SEC, uh, but they're, they're a bit of an intermediary, but they're not a state or federal regulator, uh, more of a, of a private regulatory organization. That it's, it's a bit different, uh, but it does exist. So there's really three levels of of regulation. Now, the Bureau of Securities is a member of the North American Securities Administrators. I'm the voting member and member of, chair of one of their committees. And we, as, a, as an organization, will act uh, in many cases uh, on a global basis. We will uh, look at firms on a na nationwide scale and coordinate our efforts uh, when examining a particular firm or taking an enforcement action against a firm. Uh, and that's how we, there's also various other functions, common training, you know, when we can uh, travel, a lot of it is done by way of Zoom nowadays, 
but we do participate nationally uh, in that regard. Uh, and of course, the New England regulators, we have our own group uh, and we coordinate our actions because we're such in, in New England, we're so close to each other. It's really important that we talk to each other because oftentimes uh, there are bad actors that are crossing state into, into Maine, into Vermont, into Mass, uh, to Rhode Island, Connecticut. So we, we coordinate in that respect. Are you all set, representing Hackman Phillips? Okay, next is Representative Alan Bernstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question, Mr. Gleason. I have two questions. One is the document that's up on your screen share. In the middle of it, you show um, year-to-date actuals. And the year is 50% over, and the revenue is just over 10% of what was projected. Is that typical? Is everything back weighted to the third and fourth quarter of the fiscal year? It is uh, the uh, fourth quarter and then uh, first and fourth quarter. And, and Representative, it's a, it's a very good point. As you can see, 2021 are only showing uh, 2.2 million thus far. However, this, this, this revenue is reflected through December 31. It does not reflect January revenue. We will see an enormous infusion uh, in January. As you can see, just on the broker dealer side, they all renew on January 1 of each year. So we will easily see uh, somewhere around $13 million alone, just with broker dealers that will flow, that will be reflected uh, in January. And then securities registrations, which right now are showing only 252,000, we will see at least um, 22 million flow in from mutual funds uh, during the month of March and April uh, of this year. So that's, uh, th th it doesn't give you a complete picture actually as far as what we will see come May. Uh, so there are two big revenue uh, increases in January and April, May. <laughs> Thank you. That answer is very comforting. Uh, oh, yes, comforting to me too. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Chair, I, I have a second question with your permission. Go ahead. You had mentioned that uh, it, some of the revenue is derived from mutual funds being offered in retirement plans. Yes. Uh, and just as, as a layman, it, it seems like there's some kind of migration going on right now from mutual funds to ETFs. It is. Is that perception correct? And will that affect revenue going forward? Do we collect the same amount of, is there some type of fee associated with an ETF that corresponds to it? Yes, we, we, do, uh, we do collect on uh, ETF type filings. Um, the, the, it's been a gradual progression uh, towards uh, uh, exchange traded funds. And just for, for the edification of, of the committee, uh, exchange traded funds, the price itself per share uh, or the net asset value can change from minute to minute based upon the trading activity. Unlike a mutual fund where the value of the share is set at the, conclu at the conclusion of the trading day. So ETFs are more, it's really a collection of stocks that exist within the fund, but that they can be rapidly traded throughout the day and they can fluctuate in value. So um, the, some ETFs have been performing really quite well. They're very popular um, and I, I can't say anything really negative about them um, uh, other than the fact that there is a, an additional risk when you do purchase them because the value can fluctuate. Okay, thank you for your response. I appreciate it. Uh, do we have any more questions? We don't. There is no more hands raised. So, Barry, we well, thank you for your presentation. Give us a lot to chew on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. All right. So it is now 2.24. So we've got six minutes for the next presentation. And thanks, Barry. Thank you. If, there we go. Any questions for me, of me?
when we get through today, I'll be getting in touch with uh, Chris. And we're going to talk about work sessions, and uh, which we definitely will have one, maybe two next week, which would be on Tuesday and possibly Wednesday. Thursday, we're going to do bills again, which I say again because we haven't done them yet until this Thursday. Well, Thursday the 4th, also Thursday the 11th, and then Wednesday the 17th, we'll be doing public hearings. we we'll want to um, get a draft of our first revenues around the 16th of February. And after the governor presents his budget, I want to sit down, have uh, governor's budget director sit down with us and we'll go over his revenues. And so that he, so that we can understand what his res, revenues consist of. Because we project our revenues strictly on current law. His revenues would make, might be a combination of current law and changes uh, in proposed legislation that he has in his budget. So we'll get that squared away. And then we want to close to the uh, end of April, I mean, February, we want to come out with the revenues so we can give them to the uh, Finance Committee. So that's what we're planning on doing. So tomorrow I should be able to announce we're definitely going to have work sessions on Tuesday and possibly Wednesday next week. Uh, I'm also, we need to make up our mind whether the work sessions are going to be complete virtual or like we're doing uh, our public hearings. So hopefully I can give you that information tomorrow. I'd really love to have uh, the work sessions in person, but under the circumstances, just can't do it. Uh, any questions from anybody? Mr. Chair, did you mention um, that you thought we would be holding a public hearing on um, the 17th, which I believe is Ash Wednesday? Oh, I... I didn't even take that into account. Uh, if we did, what about starting them at one o'clock? Mr. Chairman, I believe that we've held sessions on Ash Wednesday quite frequently. Well, I'd like to be able to be flexible and to be able to uh, come up with something that the majority of the committee is agreeable to. Representative uh, Phillips, is it all right if I just call you Representative Phillips? Um, I think my parents would be really sad if I was not, not addressed by their uh, name as well. So if it's helpful, if it's helpful, my last name is Hacken, like a computer hack. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, I know that Phillips. double K is a little confusing, but it, just think of a computer hack and my last name is Hacken Phillips. Pretty All right. Well, you helped me. <laughs> Good. 
Okay, Representative Hacken Phillips, um, you would not be able to attend if it was on the 17th? No, I was just trying to be considerate of my colleagues here. Uh, would it be better if we started at 10 rather than 11, uh, rather than nine? Anybody else have any any concern? Why don't you just send me a, an email or uh, or give me a phone call if you've got a preference of when to start on the 17th? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, traditionally, we Lutherans have it of worship uh, at night. I, I, I don't know whether Mary is thinking about going to church at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, maybe she goes to a Catholic church. I don't know. Is that why you- Again, I, again guys, I just wanted to bring up the issue in case anybody else had a conflict. So please don't plan around me. Thank you. Yeah, okay. If you have a conflict, let me know, please. So nine o'clock is fine. Okay. Um, if, if nine o'clock is fine, just raise your hand on the. Uh, okay. Uh, if nine o'clock is not fine, then raise your hand. So. I don't see any. Okay. And we put that question to bed, right? Great. So we'll meet at nine? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. There's one more thing that has to be accomplished. I have to get a hold of Aaron. He's just sent me an email because he had, he had misplaced the uh, email I sent him relative to what we wanted to schedule. So I uh, got to make sure I get those days. And so I'll let you know. Okay, it is 2.32. And we can go on to our final presenter for the day. And he's in already as a panelist. Thank you. So who we have today is Edward Sesson. Sesson or Sesson? Sesson. Sesson. Edward Sisson, and he's the Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Justice, and he's here to talk about the tobacco settlement revenue that we get. And that usually runs anywhere from 35 to 40 something million dollars a year. So it's yours, uh, and you have a handout, do you? I submitted a uh, brief memo to um, Christopher Shea that um, I'm not sure if that circulated. I, I do not have a, a, a PowerPoint presentation that will go up. Um, okay. All right. So uh, I have a copy of that. Uh, if Chris could make sure that a copy of that memo gets mailed to the uh, members of the committee, that'd be great. Representative Major, that memo is on our website as well. Okay. So available there if you want to see it. We, if you'd like, I can bring it up during this meeting. Would you please? Helpful. Okay, just give me a second. Yep. I am not the most technologically savvy person, so I did not want to attempt to share some sort of a presentation. Hey, join the crew. <laughs> There we go. All right. Needs to be a little bigger. Can it be made? There we go. That's better. How's that? That's much better. Okay, okay I would it's yours. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, as uh, I was introduced, my name is Edward Sisson. I'm an assistant attorney general in the Consumer Protection and Antitrust Bureau at the New Hampshire Department of Justice. I'm, my job is the tobacco enforcement attorney. So I uh, am here to talk with you today about the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement. 
My understanding is that there are some new committee members, maybe some people that are not uh, intimately familiar with the master settlement agreement beyond what they've seen in the news or were aware of uh, things that were going on uh, we have 20 nine, years ago. We have nine members there, no. Yeah, well, I, that, I'm ready to, uh, to discuss some history, uh, which will be of uh, you know, varying degrees of interest to people and then get to the part that, um, that you're probably more interested in as quickly as I can. So uh, I'm here to talk about the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement. It'll be referred to as the MSA quite frequently. Um, in the 1990s, several states sued the four largest tobacco companies to recover taxpayer money that was being spent to treat residents that had tobacco-related illnesses. There were a lot of medical expenses in the states wanted tobacco companies who they believed were responsible for those costs to pay them. In 1998, 52 states and territories settled with the four largest tobacco companies at the time and entered into the Master Settlement Agreement, or MSA. Over time, 45 additional tobacco companies have joined the MSA. So what was the purpose of the MSA? It was to reduce smoking in the United States, especially with youth. So that's something to keep in mind when you think of the MSA. The purpose of it was not to uh, create a ongoing stream of revenue to the states. It was to reduce smoking rates with the hope of eventually uh, eliminating smoking in the United States. Uh, this was accomplished by first raising the cost of cigarettes with MSA payments, uh, especially with uh, youth. If you think about teenagers being very responsive to prices, as the price of cigarettes go up, teenagers would be less able to afford cigarettes, would never start smoking as teenagers and would hopefully never become adult smokers. Restrictions in advertising, were part of the MSA. The easy way to think of that is uh, no more Joe Camel, no more Winston Cup uh, with a NASCAR, no more uh, large billboards for tobacco advertising and things like that. Uh, eliminating the practice of tobacco companies obscuring health risks. There were uh, groups like the Tobacco Institute. If you ever saw the movie, Thank You for Smoking or read the book, uh, there's a fictional character in there that works for the tobacco companies. They had these very large, well-funded research organizations that produced huge amounts of research showing that cigarettes were not bad for you and uh, created a lot of uh, misinformation. So they're no longer, they agreed to stop doing that. And then also funding educational programs that are now known as, known as the Truth Initiative to help educate particularly young people about the dangers of cigarette smoking. And uh, they do this with commercials that you may see on TV. If you have uh, younger children, you may, these ads are targeted, so you won't see them on all media, but if you're watching youth programming, then you'll see these advertisements. They have websites. They're very active on social media, trying to counter the idea that young people have of uh, smoking being something that's positive. And uh, they also get people that are, I think they're known as like ambassadors or something like that. They work on high schools and college campuses, basically trying to get the message across that cigarettes are still bad for you. Even if you're watching, you know, Mad Men on Netflix and it looks cool that Don Draper's smoking, that you should not sm start smoking, that it's gonna cause you a lot of problems. Did it work? Yes, absolutely. There's no question. The MSA performed as designed between 1998 when uh, the states and the tobacco companies entered into the MSA and 2019, U.S. cigarette smoking uh, declined by more than 50%. And you can see this just by walking around that you just see fewer people smoking now than you did even you know, 20 years ago. So it's been a major success. Uh, even more importantly, to, the, to our future, because if people don't start smoking as young people, they will not be adult smokers. You don't hear about people starting to smoke when they're in their 30s or 40s. It's people start when they're teenagers. So rates of high school smokers, it declined from a high in 1997 of 36.4%. So if you think about that, over a third of high school students were smoking in the late 1990s. And then 2019, it went to a 
just six, just around 6%. So that's a, a huge change in 20 years, 22 years. So a big, big difference. And uh, the MSA is a big part of that with the big increases in cigarette prices. So a group that helps us with um, all of this is NAG, the National Association of Attorneys General. They have a Center for Tobacco and Public Health. So they work with the settling states to preserve and enforce the MSA. So they have attorneys and support staff that do various things for the states and helping with the uh, MSA. So they work with the settling states, the tobacco companies, the independent auditor, who is a, an accounting firm, PricewaterhouseCooper, that they go through this enormous amount of sales data to figure out the payments to all the states. It's, it's quite something that they go through every year to figure this out. And it's why we don't know the final number until the check, uh, it's not even a check, but when the wire transfer goes through to the states, that's when we actually know because they figure it down to the penny for how much money you get. And uh, they represent the settling states in bankruptcy matters. Some of these tobacco companies do go bankrupt and represent us that represent in those bank hearings. And the integration between the states a big part of my week, uh, conference calls, talk. Is my, it's, my internet connection to hear me? It's getting spotty. Ah, I apologize. I, Xfinity has been not so great. Um, so they, I talk with attorneys general at um, their staff in all of the settling states multiple times a week to talk about how we're all doing with uh, tobacco matters. So what about tobacco companies that did not join the MSA? So not all tobacco companies decided to settle with the states. Some of these didn't exist at the time. Some of them were small foreign companies that came into the market after who saw an opportunity now that Philip Morris and RJ Reynolds are writing these big checks that they thought they could undercut them on price. So these are known as non-participating manufacturers or NPMs. They usually focus on low cost cigarettes. They're known as tier four subgeneric cigarettes. So if you're at the convenience store or grocery store, you typically aren't gonna see these cigarettes. These are very, very low cost cigarettes. Um, if, if you were to see them, they'd be on the very bottom shelf near the ground. Uh, these are the lowest of low cost cigarettes. So that's the market that they are uh, that they're targeting. So we have a separate law that the legislature enacted, RSA 541C, that these manufacturers have to comply with. It was designed to eliminate the price advantage that they had over the participating manufacturers. So they are required to deposit money into escrow accounts. It has to stay in there for a minimum of 25 years. It causes them to lose some of their price advantage that they could potentially have with the participating manufacturers, and it ensures that there's money there. So if a state were to file a lawsuit against them, that they couldn't uh, declare bankruptcy and have uh, and be judgment proof. So it protects the states as well. So that's a major part of my job is making sure that they're making those escrow payments. We have four active NPMs in the state of New Hampshire. If you're curious, they are uh, Korean tobacco and ginseng, which is out of uh, South Korea, Grand River Enterprises, which is out of Canada. And we have two American companies, Osterasi and Excalibur, which uh, sell cigarettes in New Hampshire. There are many more NPMs out there, but we only have four that sell here in New Hampshire. So you may be saying, okay, that's enough. What about the money? So since these payments began in 1999, New Hampshire has received over $952 million in payments. So Little New Hampshire has gotten close to a billion dollars over the course of the MSA. So since 2014, the payments have ranged from a high of just under $46 million, $45.9 million. And then in 2018 is the low at $41.4 million. And uh, what, what impacts these payments? Why do they vary? So they adjust upward based on inflation we're in a non-inflationary environment right now, as you likely know, but the agreement calls for a minimum 3% inflation in the payment. So the inflation causes the payment to go up each year. Then they go down for other reasons. 
So the decrease in the national tobacco market, again, remember the point of the MSA was to decrease cigarette sales. So this is happening as designed. So last year, the decline in sales was 7%. So a 7% decrease in tobacco sales nationwide. It's adjusted downward again for NPM sales as they increase. So those little companies I talked about, uh, they're growing. They started off as uh, close to 0% of the market and they're gradually increasing as more consumers uh, decide to go with the uh, cheaper alternatives. So they're switching from premium cigarettes like uh, you know, the Philip Morris products. They're no longer smoking Marlboros. As their finances change, they're going with lower and lower and lower cost um, options. So as those increase their sales, the, um, the, the auditor looks at it. And if they can see that, if they attribute the decrease in the participating manufacturer sales is related to that increase in NPM sales, then there can be a decrease in the, um, in the payments. And then the most important part of my job is the non-diligent enforcement of the statute. So there's the SET paid adjustment, which is the state excise tax. So any cigarette that's sold in the state of New Hampshire by an NPM, there has to be a corresponding escrow deposit made. So I work with uh, the folks over at the Department of Revenue. I make sure that every cigarette that they've collected tax on, that there is an escrow payment made for it. There is a separate independent auditor that goes over those results. And if they determine that we have not met our obligation, then they can reduce the payment uh, that we receive. So that has not happened. We've uh, done a good job making sure that escrow payments are made for all of these uh, cigarettes sold and our payment has not been reduced. So the recent trend is downward. As I said, in 2018, just under $46 million, 45.9 million for an MSA payment. In 2019, it was 44.5 million. In 2020, 42.6 million. So the predictions moving forward, I've spoken with uh, NAG, with the Tobacco Council at NAG, their prediction is that there's going to be a continuing decline in overall cigarette sales and a corresponding decrease in MSA payments. Uh, if you look at the, the memo there that uh, is on the screen, the current estimate in 2021 payment is 38.4 million, 2022 is 38.2 million, and 2023 is $36.3 million. Um, they are hesitant to make any adjustments at this time because we do not yet know what the impact of COVID-19 on cigarette sales is. Uh, it could be that people with more time on their hands have increased their smoking and that they are continuing to buy the premium brands. It could be that they have switched due to finances to lower cost brands, or if people switched to uh, vaping e-cigarettes, um, other nicotine products that are out there that are not covered by the MSA, these new nicotine lozenges or things like that. And, or if they decide they're gonna take an opportunity to quit smoking now, that would further decrease uh, tobacco sales and the MSA payments. But we do not know yet. We'll, when, when the checks come rolling in, we'll get the final answer on what the, uh, the impact was on tobacco sales in 2020. Does anyone have any questions? And the checks uh, come in and when? What month? In, in April. Uh, let me get the, actually One. have, in April, let me, I can bring up the, I actually had the calendar up. Just give me one second, I can pull up the calendar. I apologize, that is, 
I had been thinking that as something that I would have had written down. <laughs> While you're doing that, uh, we need to come up with revenues by the end of February, and then uh, we'll look at them again by the time that the House votes on the budget and, uh, and sends it over to the Senate. And I doubt if we have the, the value of what the payment will be at that point in time. Well, the only time we'll be able to use that is when we do the committee of conference, which will be in June and we deal with the Senate. But we're going to be looking at our revenues again anyway at that point in time. According to this that I just pulled up, it's April 22nd. Yeah. So. So it's almost the end of the fiscal year. Yeah. Is that it? Yes, that, that is all I have. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to uh, do my well, best to answer them. And if, if I need to, I can look it up and get back to uh, the committee if I don't have the answer handy. We have three lined up with questions. The first is Representative Alan Bernstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Sisson. Um, my question, it, it might be better for Christopher Shea to answer this, or perhaps the chair, or, or Mr. Sisson. What I'm doing is I'm comparing your memo, specifically the third paragraph, where we talk about, where, where you reference how much we received in 2019 and 2020. And I'm comparing that to the CAFR page 146. And the, uh, the 2019 number ties to the penny. The 2020 number is, is nowhere close. Um, <clears throat> it, it's showing just under 26 million was collected in 2020. This is per the CAFR, page 146. And <clears throat> I just can't reconcile the difference between 42 million and 26 million. Uh, Chris or Norm, can, can anybody help me out here? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, Representative Burstein, but I, I can look into that and get back to the committee and see why the reference. It seems like that 26 million is way off. Yeah, it, it, it might just be a typo. If you look at the number uh, per the memo, it's 42,599,000. It, it looks like a digit was dropped off of that. So maybe it's just a typo. Um, anyway, let's give Chris a chance to take a look at it. And yep. Chris will get back with that. Yep, I'll, I'll get, hopefully I'll get something by the end of today. And so tomorrow I'll be able to answer the question when you guys meet. Okay. okay. Next question, Representative Ames. Okay. Am I still on? Yeah. Uh, so my question has to do with the uh, both the black market and vaping and uh, impact on uh, trends for uh, taxable sales of cigarettes. Maybe uh, any information you have on that score would be helpful to us. Yes, so um, e-cigarettes, as you know, are taxed in New Hampshire. So sales of e-cigarettes, vaping, things, whatever terminology you want to use are taxed. So there is tax revenue coming in. However, they are not underneath the master settlement agreement. So there is no MSA payment that goes along with those. Um, with uh, black market uh, cigarettes, there, then there would be nothing. There would be no tax revenue. Those would not be part of the MSA. Um, I've spoken with people over at the uh, Liquor Commission who are out there looking for it and looking for contraband. And when they find it, it's confiscated and, um, and they prosecute those that they find. So uh, New Hampshire is uh, making sure that we are finding those and that there's not illegal tobacco. Um, something that to keep in mind is that we have um, compared to our neighbors, a lower uh, cigarette tax. So there's less of an incentive for people to break the law and bring non-tax cigarettes into New Hampshire. It would not make a lot of sense unless they were to go all the way down to Pennsylvania. All of the Northeast, we have the lowest uh, cigarette tax. So we would have the, uh, the least incentive to why risk it? Why risk breaking the law with this? Okay. 
to, you know, it wouldn't make any sense. Okay, before we go to the next question, uh, Alan, I looked up the revenue focus for June of 2020, which is the end of fiscal 20, and the tobacco settlement money that came in for that year, which is $42.6 million. So it must, uh, there's a problem there because the focus shows 42.6. Um, Representative Major, if I might. Yeah. I the answer to the question is your page 146 of the CAFR is only the general fund portion. The first $40 million of the settlement goes directly into the education trust fund. Yes. So there was 42 and change collected in the settlement last year. So you're seeing the 2.5 million that went to the general fund. If you scroll down to page 148, you'll see the $40 million for the remaining amount of the tobacco settlement. Wow. Education sure, trust. Chris, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I didn't get it right away. Very good. Okay, Representative Brown. This wasn't my original question. I, I was wanna ask Chris, so what happens this year if, if uh, revenues go uh, below 40 million? How's that made up? And that's not my question of the, of the uh, speaker so, for Chris. So um, Representative Brahmi, the first $40 million of the tobacco settlement so goes directly into the education trust fund. So if there's a number less than 40 million, it just all goes to the tobacco education trust fund. And it has to be made up somehow. The benefit is when you get something over 40 million, then it drops into the um, general fund and you have the ability to use it in other places in the budget. Okay, thank you. And the, uh, the real question is, so in the check that's coming in April, that's in the formula that's used for that that check for all the states that participate in this uh, is based on the cigarette sales in what period? Is it calendar or calendar uh, 20 or do you know? It would be from sa sales year 2020. So calendar year 20. Calendar? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that would be mostly in the, uh, uh, in the period of the COVID, Not, uh, you know, three quarters of that year is COVID uh, months. Yes, and this is something we've been talking about. I've, uh, it's it, it's going to be interesting to see what the impact is and what changes in consumer behavior, because it has been a complete change in people's lives in every way. So um, no one feels comfortable guessing what the final outcome is going to be, but we will know. Okay, hey, thank you. Follow up on that is the uh, sale of the tobacco stamps in 2020 versus 2019, have you looked at that? So I've spoken with the Department of Revenue. Uh, they track, um, for, for me, the NPM sales. So we track those very tightly because of the escrow requirements with the, um, the participating manufacturers so that they don't have those, um, the reporting on that done. So the, the Stamps are purchased by wholesalers and the certified stamping agents. So those aren't necessarily all applied. They weren't all applied in 2020. They could have gotten some that are still to be applied in 2021. But when they finish, they will have a final number um, on that, but they do not have it yet. We're usually more concerned with the non-participating manufacturers. Representative Almy. Yeah, um, I said, do the does sales uh, during calendar year 20 mean uh, sales that were completed to the consumer or sales that were completed um, from the tobacco wholesaler where we tax it, which then would divide into those that paid by bond and hadn't paid yet and the rest of them? So you're asking for sales that factor into the MSA payment? Is that yes, yes. I need to check on that. I, I know for escrow payment purposes, it's when the stamp is applied. So it's when the wholesaler sells them to the retailer and applies a stamp. At that point, they're considered sold. 
Um, I do not know with certainty if that is also when they get factored into the MSA payment. I would like to check that. Thank you. And if I am getting back- It, it does this, make a difference of a month of 2020 in terms of, of uh, COVID. Yes, it would. It, it could make a difference. Um, when I get that answer, would I send it to um, Christopher Shea, and then he would send that, or how would that get sent yeah, out? You, you could send it to uh, Chris, Christopher Shea, and he could send it to us. Further questions? Send no further questions. I, I thank you very much for your presentation and bring everybody up to speed on the history of the master settlement agreement. Thank you for having me. Have a, a good day all. You were right on time. <laughs> thank you. All right, uh, members of the committee, do you have any questions of me before we sign off and get ready for tomorrow morning because I need to get busy to get the schedule. <laughs> Could you repeat, Mr. Chairman, the date of the budget here of the hearing that you spoke of? Well, we have the hearings, public hearings this Thursday. Yes, I knew that, but then you had another <clears throat> and one. And then uh, the 4th of February, the 11th of February, and the 17th of February. Great. It's enormously helpful, I'm sure, to, to me to have these dates, and I'm sure to others. And, and what I'm trying to work out right now is the second and third of February for work sessions. And if we might need to, and I should be able to tell you that uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much. I think this goes very smoothly. I'm impressed. Okay. All right. Any further questions? If not, then we'll see you tomorrow morning for at nine o'clock. And thanks everybody for being very attentive. Thanks, Norm. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Chris, would you stay on? Or Chris, give me a call. Okay, I'll give you a call. Yeah.